G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Castbox for helping me make the Castbox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. Now, Castbox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favourite podcasts there. Personally, I think Castbox is the best podcasting platform out there. And I hope you guys check it out, because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have, and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. The Showers, Part 1, by Clover10176 Every area and all parts of the world has those area-specific urban legends that just refuse to die. But whether the stories are about a haunted asylum on the outskirts of the city, a creature that lives in the nearby woods, or a ghost that haunts a lonely stretch of road outside of town, there is always a common thread within the tales. No one has ever been to these places, seen the creatures or witnessed any hauntings with their own eyes. There are members of every generation who will proclaim that they know someone whose brother's best friend or sister went to the haunted house with 13 floors that used real blood and snakes and spiders and is so scary that no one has ever made it all the way through. Those same people will swear by these stories without ever being able to provide a shred of evidence or a name of someone who could provide proof of the claims simply because everyone around here knows that it's a true story. The storytellers eventually pass the tales on to their children, who modify them just enough to keep them up with the changing times. And the cycle continues. I'm as skeptical as anyone when it comes to these stories, seeing as I was like a junkie when I was younger, constantly searching for terrifying stories about whatever area of the country I was living in at the time. I made up and spread stories about haunted pizza parlors in New York, my cousin's encounter with the Jersey Devil, or how my grandfather encountered a feral, human-like demon creature in the woods of Colorado. I even broke the one rule with these stories by putting myself in them. But this took guts, in hindsight, because I had to make sure that I always told the same story the same way. Surprisingly, no one ever called my bluff, too. I like to think that I have had some wonderful contributions to various urban legends around the Midwest and Northeastern states. I moved around a lot. There was always a surge of joy whenever I would wander the halls at school and hear one of my classmates retelling my stories to another one of his friends, adding little bits here and there like a massive game of telephone. I knew, of course, that the stories were complete fiction, but I stood my ground whenever someone asked me about them. I would even manage to act a little bit, speaking with a shaky voice or looking scared when I would recount a situation that I supposedly experienced myself. I suppose this aspect of my childhood has led to my current predicament, which I'll recount in full for all of you guys to take from it what you will. I have laid this little introduction out as a sort of disclaimer, aimed particularly at those who will call my story into question. I have been like the boy who cried wolf for years, but I assure you with every ounce of honesty and integrity that I have at this time, the wolf, it's real. From my introduction, it's probably apparent that I moved around the country quite a bit in my middle and high school years. Neither of my parents had anything to do with any branch of armed forces. They simply just didn't tend to hang around any given place for too long. I suppose that it had some sort of effect on me, but I wasn't hurt by it or anything of the sort. Growing up, I was a complete ham. I made friends very easily, was often the class clown, and because of that, was often disliked by my teachers. Again, 
This was never an issue, as I was usually in another state by the time the next semester rolled around anyway. But my friendships were often fleeting, as were any positive relationships that I ever had with my teachers. Because of the events that followed, my memory of one teacher in particular is probably slightly skewed, but I'll attempt to give the least biased version of our friendship that I can. Mr. Mays was one of my social study teachers in the early years of my high school experience. But being older now, I can understand how horrible children are to deal with around that age, and I respect him to no ends for the way that he was able to connect with the students. He seemed like one of us. He talked like us, made pop cultural references that were current, listened to cool music, and sometimes he would even say hell or damn while he was giving a passionate lecture about Native American history or something like that. A teacher that swore, even a little bit, was the epitome of cool to a freshman in high school. My memories of Mr. Mays mostly stem from the way that he really got into anything that he was doing. The instance that is still very vivid in my mind was of course around Halloween of my sophomore year. Mr. Mays had the typical teacher decorations around the classroom. Smiling jack-o'-lanterns and black cat cartoons. Typical and boring in the minds of egotistic high school students. However, on the 31st of October, when most other teachers were rolling their eyes at the fact that teenagers still took dressing up in costumes on Halloween seriously, Mr. Mays took the whole cool teacher thing to a new level. We walked into the classroom and were surprised to find the blinds drawn, sheets over the small windows, candles lighting the room, and a single frowning jack-o'-lantern sitting on a stool in front of the desks. Mr. Mays sat at his desk, just watching the students come into class and take their seats. He didn't even ask anyone to be quiet because the moment that everyone walked into the room, they were either too excited to care about petty conversations or too confused to bother with them anymore. The students took their seats as Mr. Mays began his lecture. He spoke quietly to set the mood and took a seat on a chair right next to the jack-o'-lantern in the center of the room. You know, today is probably my favorite day of the year, class, he said in a monotonous voice. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and I want to share with you exactly why I love it so much. One girl raised her hand with a concerned look on her face. I'm pushing the due date for your papers to next Thursday, said Mr. Mays, without bothering to look at the girl who slowly put her hand down, looking around at the other students with a hint of embarrassment. The class erupted in quiet cheers, and Mr. Mays waited for the inevitable silence. He began his story immediately after the class had calmed down. I will attempt to recreate the amazing story that Mr. Mays told the class that day. The way in which he told this story rendered the horror junkies speechless and the rest of the class terrified. The same girl that had raised her hand to ask about the paper was holding her knees to her chest by the end of it, a look of horror on her face. The important thing to know was what the story was about. The specifics slipped my mind now and aren't too relevant. I'll try to recount the parts of the story that matter the most, but don't hold me to it. Basically, Mr. Mays and his friends set out on a road trip around the country after graduating from college. They took a truck, loaded it with camping gear, and set out to sightsee for the entire summer. The group went from New Jersey down to the coast of Florida, New Orleans to California, and up to Washington. From there, they went to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and then back to New York. This concept of freedom to travel anywhere had the entire class hooked in an instant. Mr. Mays was the coolest teacher ever, in my eyes too. Being adventurous college kids, the group didn't bring a map. There were no time constraints, so they just kind of drove in the general direction they wanted to go and eventually found a town to stay in or some place that looked interesting. He told us that after spending a week in Colorado, he and his friends had to travel through miles and miles of corn, plains and more corn. He assumed that they were either in Nebraska or Kansas when they decided to pull their extra cash and stay in a hotel for the night. They settled into a motel in some town that Mr. Mays could barely remember the name of when 
one of his friends realized that they were somewhere near his grandfather's farm. He wasn't entirely sure where it was, but being adventurous college kids, they decided to get a quick refund from the motel and try to contact the friend's grandpa. They were unable to get a hold of the grandpa on the phone, so the group figured it would be fun to just show up. Mr. Mazer's friend was adamant that his grandparents would take them in and feed them without a moment of hesitation. So the group set out with an hour of sunlight, seeking the salvation of a comfortable house to stay in. In Kansas or Nebraska or wherever it may have been, there aren't a whole lot of natural markers that could guide lost travelers. Any directions given to someone who didn't live around the area basically amounted to go a couple of miles to the corn, take a right and go down a dirt road to the other corn, there should be some wheat on your right, etc, etc. So, as is the case in most scary stories, the group, they got lost. Never wanting to admit defeat though, they drove into the night, making wrong turns every five minutes until they found themselves on a wooded road that Mr. Mays' friend was certain that his grandparents lived off of. Mr. Mays described the road as basically a dark path to hell. I wasn't entirely sure how true this was because he got very excited and a bit ridiculous with his explanations of the trees that almost tried to grab the car and the red eyes of countless animals looking at them from the darkness. But regardless, the typical horror tropes worked on most of the class. Everyone was terrified at this time. So, the group of guys drove on this dark road for about 15 minutes before they came to a clearing and a small building with lights in it, and what seemed to be a silo. They figured that, at the very least, the people who lived here would be able to help them find where the guy's grandparents lived. The whole idea of everyone knows everyone in these hick parts of the country fueled his hope. They pulled the car up near the building, realizing when they were out of the car that it appeared to be like one of the kind of places where one would store a whole bunch of chickens and not a home. But still, the lights were on, so they figured that they would give it a try. But they approached the building as a group, looking in the semi-open sliding door to find a big empty room. Hanging fluorescent lights lit the room like it was daytime, and they couldn't see a soul. There were no cars, but one of Mr. Mays' friends was convinced that he saw someone as they pulled up. So... They decided to go inside and see if there was an office or something where someone might still be working. Why else would they have this huge place lit up like that, right? There were no doors on the inside of the building. Again, it was just a giant empty hall. So, the group roamed around the property and over towards the silo. As they got closer, they noticed what appeared to be a cellar door. At this point... I remember Mr. Mays telling the entire class to learn from his idiotcy. He told us that he hadn't seen many horror movies before that time, and didn't think twice about approaching a creepy cellar door in the middle of a dark, scary foreign place. He said that approaching that door was one of his biggest regrets, in fact. Mr. Mays let the whole class know at this point that he was going to tell us as much as he deemed appropriate about the experience. He felt that we were mature enough to handle it, but advised anyone that was squeamish to leave the class early. Several students quietly gathered their things and walked out the door, a couple of them being stoners who saw this as an opportunity to smoke behind the school before their next class. I didn't even give the announcement a second thought though. Like I said, I was and am a sucker for this kind of stuff and Mr. Mace was telling a story better than anything I had ever conjured up myself. I wanted to learn from this guy, even though I didn't believe much of the story. After the class had thinned a bit, Mr. Mace continued with the story. He told the remaining few that he and his friends opened that cellar door, releasing a smell that he only described as the most putrid thing my senses have ever experienced. The group was no longer concerned with finding the owners of the property, but was now set on finding the source of that smell. They went down the steps into the cellar, which was lit by a single bulb spaced sporadically along the ceiling of a long hallway. 
no one spoke because things had gotten too strange. The walls were lined with metal sheeting, similar to the roofing on farms. The hallway itself was crooked and the ceilings constantly lowered and rose, like a tunnel that was hastily dug and then never touched up. There were sections where the boys had to almost crouch in order to pass, in fact. The worst part, Mr. Mace told us, was that the light bulbs continuously flickered, sometimes acting like a strobe light and making it very difficult to move through the winding and unstable hallways. In hindsight, he was certain that his mind was playing tricks on him, but he remembered seeing flashes of things that couldn't be there. He said that when you're that focused on something, or if you're that nervous, your mind can do that to you. It can just simply revolt, showing you things or people that aren't there. G'day mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favour to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's b-i-s-h dot b-u-s-t-a at gmail dot com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the rest of the story. He continued to describe the hallway, and I was on the edge of my seat at this point. The halls were windy and seemed to go on forever. But Mr. Mays guessed that they were somewhere under the creepy forest that they had driven through when they found a door, but he couldn't be sure. He said that they came upon a door after walking for what felt like a mile. It was a simple and wooden one, but it looked like it belonged outside of a suburban home. It had a nice design, seemed to be freshly painted red, and had a very nice knob and knocker on it. It was a door that belonged at the entrance to a nice house, and not one that would be sitting in a dirt tunnel in the middle of nowhere. His friend walked towards the door, moving carefully because of the flashing light bulb and increasingly uncertainty about the stability of the surrounding walls. He turned to the group, the rest of which were nervous at the very least, and attempted to lighten the mood with a laugh before he said, I, uh, I guess I should probably knock first. Mr. May's friend grabbed the steel knocker and hit it against the door several times, mockingly but quietly uttering, Uh, is anyone home? The group waited about 30 seconds before the tension broke. The guy next to the door shrugged his shoulder and went to walk back to his friends. But as he did, the light bulb between them surged and exploded. The boys shielded their eyes and looked back to their lone friend by the door. As he lowered his hands, one of the metal sheets of the makeshift roof dropped. The edge of the sheet fell directly onto the boy's forehead, slicing it open and sending a wave of blood down his face. The impact apparently knocked him out and he fell back against the door, knocking it open in the process. The entirety of the group rushed through the dim light to their friend, barely noticing the seemingly pitch black room that now lay before them. Mr. Mace was the first to make it to his friend's side. He lifted the guy's head into his arms, immediately taking off his jacket and putting it over his forehead to attempt to stop the bleeding. Once the group had calmed down, Mr. Mays noticed that the arm that had been bracing his friend's head was soaking wet. He was confused about this and was attempting to sort it out when one of his friends started talking. He said something along the lines of, The lights, we have to go. When Mr. Mays took notice... So, you know when you turn off a light, he told the class, and everything is almost pitch black, except the light of the bulb dying or cooling down? It was like that, but there were so many of them. At least 20 light bulbs had lit the room seconds ago, and now only look like little stars in the darkness. That was definitely terrifying, but that wasn't the scariest thing. It was still a very dim light coming from the hallway behind them, and though it was weak, 
It lit the room up just enough to see the shape of tens of people standing less than ten feet in front of them. Mr. Mazer's friend went to say something else as one of the bulbs to their right flickered to life. Let me interrupt at this point and say that Mr. Maze was generally a playful guy. He had that tone of voice that makes you want to respond. Basically, he could say, let's go jump off a cliff, guys, and you would want to respond with, all right, Mr. Maze, show us the way. That's a ridiculous statement, I know, but I hope it gets the point across. He was a charismatic guy. And the whole story up to this point had been told like a campfire story. He had the voice inflections of someone attempting to be mysterious and scary, which worked, but was noticeable. But at this point in the tale, I recall that everything changed completely. He was no longer attempting to spook anyone. I could tell that this section was difficult for him, in fact. Either... He was a very good actor, or it was a really terrifying memory for him to relive. He told us that the light bulb came to life and illuminated the group of people in front of him. In the dim light, he could see children, at least 20 of them in just the visible light. They were all dressed in nightgowns that looked to be tattered and torn, stained dark with something. Their hair was long. Every single one of them looked like they had not had a haircut since birth. Some of the children were almost completely obscured by the length of it, in fact. Every single one of them didn't appear to have been in a shower or nice bath in their entire life either. Mr. Mays told us that the most terrifying part of the whole thing, though, was that none of the children were moving. They were all standing, staring, most of them only visible from the faint light reflecting off of their eyes. His whole group was paralyzed with fear for several seconds when they heard what sounded like an animal in the distance yelping. The way it was described was like the sound of a dog crying multiplied by ten. This spurred the group to life just as the children began to step forward. His friends grabbed the injured one and lifted him out of the room and into the hallway in an instant. Mr. Mays took another second to move and had difficulty finding his bearings. He reached to his left in an attempt to find a wall to lean against and ended up finding a handle, then pulled hard, never losing his vision on the children. He bolted to the door right as he noticed what he had grabbed onto. A shower head protruding from a cement wall, reaching maybe a foot into the room. There was something leaking from it too, but it was too dim to tell what it was. He realized that it had been leaking onto him, but he didn't care. There were now children stammering towards him as an animal cried in the distance, and his friend was seriously injured. As he left the room, he made a point to emphasize that he could make out several more shower heads on the wall near the single dim light bulb. Yeah, so this is why they called them the showers, Mr. Mace told the class. I was transfixed, sitting as far forward on my desk would allow, bracing for more. So I slammed the red door behind me, he said, and ran through that hallway faster than I've ever run before or since. I made it back to the car and we drove out of there like a bat out of hell. A couple of students snickered at his use of the word hell. So, when you're out trick-or-treating tonight, make sure you know exactly where you're headed, okay? And don't go out to any abandoned farmhouses. I mean, there aren't many around here, but you're all smart kids. Except Jerry. The class laughed at this, and the mood lightened as the bell rang for passing period. Mr. Mace turned the light on and thanked everyone for listening reminded them about the paper due next week and told us to have a safe and happy Halloween. The students all around me were abuzz with theories about the story they just heard. I bet it's some sort of crazy Nazi hideout, said one girl. I think they're all ghost babies that were killed by a dog, said another. I, on the other hand, couldn't theorize in the slightest. 
I was still caught up in that moment. The way that Mr. Mazer told that story and the detail that he'd included in it left me feeling that we didn't get the whole story. A couple of days later, I stayed after class and asked him about how it really ended and what happened to his friend. He laughed and said that his friend was fine and that it was honestly, and he whispered this part, probably due to some of the drugs that they were on at the time. Mr. Mays winked at me as if to say, don't tell anyone about the drugs bit, kid. And I smiled and just left. I lived in that town for another couple of months and then was rapidly moved halfway across the county to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I twisted the story around and told it around campfires as I got older and it was always a hit, but I always changed the ending, letting the friend die of blood loss or some being dragged away by the children. It wasn't until college that I had the chance to talk to Mr. Mays again. I went to college in northern New York, not for any reasons associated with this story. College was a fun time for me, and I continued to be the hand that I always had been. It wasn't until sometime around my junior year that I ran into Mr. Mays at a bar that I frequented. Initially, I couldn't be sure that the person I saw laying with his head buried in his arm at the bar was Mr. Mays. The only trait that grabbed my attention was a sweater that he used to wear on his birthday during class. The shirt simply read, I'm the birthday boy. I told my group of friends to grab a table and that I would join them in a second, then walked over to the man at the bar. Mr. Mays? I said, and the man looked up. The man took a second to look at my face before he smiled and put a hand on my shoulder and said, Hey there, son. How you been? I could smell some strong whiskey on his breath and his cheeks were flushed. The look in his eyes told me that he was three sheets to the wind and probably had no idea who I was. Mr. Mays, it's Jack. I was a student of yours for a couple of semesters about six or so years ago. His face changed a bit and a genuine look of recognition set in. He took a calmer tone, smiled, and said, Ah, yeah, I remember. How have you been, Jack? We talked for a solid 20 minutes. I told him what I'd been doing for the last several years, and he also told me. Apparently, he was teaching at the same school, doing the same old shtick, as he called it. I asked him if everything was alright, and he said that they were as good as they ever had been, or ever were going to get. It took me a while to realize that I was an adult that was having a conversation with another adult. Every time I had spoken to Mr. Mays previously, it had been in the student-teacher relationship. But now, I was just a guy having a drink with a friend at the bar. My friends eventually left, and I continued to drink with Mr. Mays. He told me about his divorce and his kids, Things that I never would have asked or cared about previously. But now, I cared. He was a real person to me, not just an idol anymore. This was a guy who had real problems, and not the infallible teacher that I once thought he was. It had been several hours before I even brought up the story about the showers. I told him all about my history and urban legends and scary stories and... He just laughed. When I mentioned the story that he told us years ago, he almost seemed uncomfortable. He finished his whiskey, signaled for another, and then turned to me and got really serious. Listen, Jack, I don't know why I kept telling that story year after year. His words were slightly slurred, or my hearing was messed up. But we were both sufficiently blitzed at this point. That was what my therapist told me to do when I was younger. I had to tell people it, it to come to grips with it or some shit. He took a big swig of his drink. Wait, your therapist? I said. Mr. Mays laughed heartily and looked at me. <laughs> of course, Jack. You think that something like that wouldn't fuck a person up? 
I was confused, but smiled nonetheless. Things had just gotten really strange. But, I mean, you said you were all on drugs or something, right? No one was too terribly hurt. You were all okay, right? He got almost cartoonish with his sadness in the next several seconds. Of course we didn't, Jack. Why do you think I'm here right now? Well, I was puzzled. I quickly filled with a thousand questions that I wanted to ask him, but I let him carry on. Tim fucking... He didn't make it. <laughs> he laughed. His laugh turned suddenly to tears. <laughs> they fucking took him. They did. I don't even know. Cops told us that we were just drunk. That he wandered off and got taken by the wildlife. He didn't know. He didn't see it, Jack. I was absolutely stoned face at this point. Mr. Mays was carrying along like I knew the actual story. But I didn't. His friend disappeared. I wish... They'd found the body, though, at least. Then we could have shown them. He sighed. That's a bad place, Jack. I don't know anything else to say. It's a bad place. He carried on for a couple of minutes more about his friend and the fun they'd had before they went on that trip. And I let him talk. It was only a few minutes later that his phone rang. Oh, hey, sweetheart, he whispered into the phone. Yeah, yeah, I'll be out in a second. Right, <clears throat> I love you, baby. The person on the other end hung up on the phone and Mr. Mays got up to leave. You know, it's been nice seeing you, Jackie. You've got a good head on your shoulders, boy. Make sure you use it, okay? He began to walk out of the bar. <sighs> Mr. Mays? I yelled after him. Yeah, Jack? He turned back towards me. Where'd you say all that showers business took place? Where? Hell, I didn't mention it, did I? It's somewhere outside Broken Bow, Nebraska. Fucking hell on earth if you ask me. Mr. Mays walked out of the bar after waving to me, running into the wall before eventually finding the door. And that was the last time that I would see him. I'd never be able to tell him the impact that he had on my life. Or rather, the impact that his story had on me. He'd never know about the trip that we took after graduation, almost mimicking the one that he and his friends had made. He would never know that the things that he saw at that place were real. Why? Well... He died about a month later. His liver failed on him. It's alright though, because his family was with him in the hospital room. He got to die around people that cared about him. And that's all a man like him can ask for. But I experienced that place too, several years later. That's where my story turns, in fact. The following is the story of how I came to find the showers and why I'll never, ever go anywhere near Nebraska again. I'll finish this story when I sober up. My memory isn't clear enough just yet. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family and on social media too. Thanks again for listening, guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one. G'day, mates. It's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71.
Now, CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android. And you can find all of your favorite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there. And I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening. And without further ado, let's begin. The Showers, Part 2, by Clover10176. So, I'm awake now, and semi-sober, and ready to finish this for you guys, the internet, and whoever cares to hear it. I didn't find out that Mr. Maze had passed away until a couple of months after the funeral service. Initially, I was going to seek out his family in order to send my condolences, but... It wasn't as if Mr. Mays and I were best friends or anything like that, so I just refrained. I continued through my college career and graduated a year or so after our bar meeting. Graduating with English as my major wasn't a mistake, but it wasn't exactly something that landed me any sort of immediate jobs after college. Now, I had saved a pretty solid amount of money while I was in school and decided that I deserved a bit of a vacation, if you will. I took my spare cash and got together with my college buddy Steve, packed up and hit the road, aiming for somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. I had lived near Littleton, Colorado when I was younger and remembered loving the area, so this destination was as good as any. The trip? It was a success. We made it somewhere around Estes Park, Colorado and found a cheap cabin that we rented for about a month. The days were filled with laughing, hiking, and generally things that involved little to no work on our parts. After our rental was through, we packed up again and headed on our way back east. Sometime during this trip, we met a couple of natives in one of the local bars. We never typically hung out with them or anything like that. We just had conversations now and then over drinks and food. One night, these guys were paying their tab and packing up to leave awfully early. They were usually there until the wee hours of the morning. When we questioned them about it, they told us that they were heading to a little get-together with some friend of theirs, and they invited us. Having nothing else to do, we hopped in the car and followed them to the party. The party itself was pretty low-key, and ultimately inconsequential to this story. However, the important thing about it was that at some point in the night... We were all sitting around the fire and swapping ghost stories. At this point in my life, I wasn't as much of a ham as I was in my younger years. But with a little bit of encouragement, I started on a couple of stories that I remembered telling in my youth. Eventually, I made it to Mr. May's story about the showers. Every time that I had told it after hearing it from Mr. May's, I had spiced it up a little bit. But... Out of some sort of subconscious respect for my former teacher, I went straight into the version that he told my class in my sophomore year of high school. The group enjoyed my stories for the most part, the showers being the mutual favourite among the partygoers. Steve and I left for the cabin at around 5 in the morning and he asked me about that story on the drive home. I told him all about Mr. Mays, that class, and my love for everything horror-related and whatnot. And he suggested that we try to find the place on our return trip to New York. Initially, I was reluctant, simply because I didn't feel like aimlessly wandering through Nebraska for days, looking for some old farm building that was probably demolished at this point. But a couple of days before we left Colorado, I told Steve that it sounded like fun. We weren't going to be able to do another trip like this for a long time, so... I figured we might as well make the best of it. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought of it as a a little tribute to Mr. Mays, a guy that, in retrospect, helped me realize that I wanted to be a writer. Anyway, we left Colorado and made the long, boring and barren drive to Broken Bow, Nebraska, or hell on earth as Mr. Mays had put it. We found a motel in town and hung around for a couple of days venturing out a hundred miles or so in any given direction each day after that. 
I remembered Mr. Mays telling us that it was somewhere outside of Broken Bow, but I don't think he got any more specific than that. We tried asking the townsfolk if they had any information about the showers, but we were usually met with blank stares or eye-rolling when we told them what exactly this place was. The only person who seemed to know anything about it was an older lady that worked at a gas station on the outskirts of town. I don't recall her name, but this woman was just one of those cheerful old people, very helpful and generally interested in what anyone had to say to her. Steve had started talking to her at the checkout and she asked about our license plate, commenting about the fact that we were very far from home. We had nowhere in particular to be, so Steve and I ended up talking to this woman for about 15 minutes, at which point we brought up our hunt for the place known as The Showers. Initially, the name didn't ring any bells with the woman, which made sense, seeing as Mr. Mays had given it the name after his experience there. But when I began to describe the details that I remembered from his story, the friendly old woman interrupted me. Her tone was not scornful or mean in any way, but she became very tense and deliberate with her words from that point on. People don't deal with anything relating to that sort of business around here anymore she told us. That was all a a long time ago. Following her statements, she attempted to be cheerful again, excusing us off to the restroom and wishing us the best on our return trip to New York. Steve and I returned to the car with not a word. Both of us were thinking, though, about what the lady had said. Again, she didn't seem to be angry at all. She just didn't want to hear another word about it, though. We were driving back to the hotel before Steve said something. I mean, if I had to live in a place associated with an urban legend or something like that, I would totally mess with anyone who asked about it, he said. I mean, eventually you'd just get tired of people asking about it, right? And so you'd just try to scare them to get them to shut up, wouldn't you? I agreed with Steve and kept driving, but the whole experience just wasn't sitting right with me. If this was some sort of well-known legend in the area, why did no one else in town seem to know anything about it? But I managed to shrug it off. Mind you, neither of us was scared of finding the showers. This little excursion on our road trip was more like a scavenger hunt, a cap-off to an overall relaxing vacation. Steve and I were basically like tourists, hunting for a site at which a famous movie was filmed or something like that. We went into the whole situation with little to no expectations and a fleeting hope that we would be able to find this place. We spent another day in Broken Bow before we took our next trip out to try and find the showers. Nebraska isn't as terrible of a place as people make it out to be, but it really isn't all that exciting. We found a bar and spent some time there, and that was just about the extent of our activity on our day off. When we did get back on the road, we decided that we would attempt to stay off the main roads for as much of the day as we could. I knew there was no way that this place was going to be off of a highway or anything, and I remembered some detail about a dirt road in Mr. May's story, so we went looking for those. This was a fairly futile effort, though, because most of Nebraska is dirt roads. It was seven in the evening when we came upon a small but thick forest. I use the term lightly, but for Nebraska, this place was like an oasis. The trees were full and thick, shrouding most of its inside in darkness. The sun was setting, and even though we'd run into a few of these random crops of trees, we agreed that this one showed more promise than any of the others. There wasn't really a road, but there looked to be a path where a dirt road might have been at some point. So, we drove along that. If the car was able to handle the Rocky Mountains, a dirt path in Nebraska would give us no trouble. We moved slowly and carefully along this trail, making sure to clear any fallen trees in the road or rocks that would render the car useless when the sun finished setting. It was pretty dark in this place during the day, but when night came, it was something else entirely. I had an inkling at this point that we had found the right place, but... I didn't want to jinx it, so we continued on. 
I didn't realize it at the time, but the little bits of light that managed to penetrate the canopy on this miniature forest actually did make it look as if the tree branches were trying to grab the car, just like Mr. Mays had mentioned in his story. I'm still convinced that he made up the part about the animal eyes, though. The most aggressive creature that we saw in the woods was a dead rabbit on the side of the trail. It didn't have any obvious signs of death, though. It just looked like it had simply laid down and just never bothered to get up. Anyway, we drove around in the darkness for quite a while before we found a clearing. We had to move several smaller clusters of branches out of the way before, but right in front of our exit was a giant, dead monster of a tree. There was no way that we were moving this one, so we got out and turned on the bright headlights in the hopes that it would illuminate the area in front of us. There was a feeling of excitement mixed strangely with fear when I saw what lay 50 feet beyond the clearing. There, lit partially by the headlights from the car and the little bit of light from the crescent moon, was what appeared to be an old barn house. This wasn't a typical farmhouse too. It was larger than the barns that I had seen in films and didn't have any sort of crest. It basically looked like a small warehouse. I wasn't entirely sure at this point if this was the place that we were looking for, but this was definitely the closest that we had come. I moved through the brush until I was roughly 20 feet from the entrance, at which point all the growth seemed to stop. I don't know if the owners had done something to the soil, but the whole structure had a border around it that was clear of any sort of plant life. I approached the entrance to the building, a large sliding door as Steve came up behind me with two flashlights in hand. So you were just going to run off into that place in the dark? He laughed. I gave a half-hearted chuckle and grabbed one of the flashlights from his hand. Mine was a little, but pretty bright flashlight. It was the kind that hikers would most likely fasten to their backpacks, just in case they were stranded at night or something. But it worked well enough. I grabbed the metal door with both hands, holding the flashlight with my mouth, and gave it a tug. It moved slightly, creaked a little bit, but there was no way that I was doing this myself. Steve came up from behind me, set his flashlight on the ground, grabbed the door and said, One, two, and three. We pulled at the door with all that we could muster. But once we had managed to move it a couple of inches, it must have latched back onto its track because it slid very easily, stopping hard with a loud and echoing thud when it was completely open. Steve picked up his flashlight and walked behind me. I had already moved inside at this point. The inside of the structure was exceptionally bare, almost troublingly so. I wasn't entirely sure how far we were from the nearest home or small town, but there wasn't even the slightest bit of evidence that anyone had been in this building for years. There were no broken beer bottles or empty bags of chips. But there weren't even any animal droppings or eager plants that managed to grow here. But the room was expansive larger than your average farm, but not the warehouse-sized monstrosity that I believe Mr. Mace described in his story. I wasn't sure if it was simply a holding area for farming equipment or something similar at some point. Disappointed, I wandered near the entrance while Steve ventured into the expanse of darkness. As I was running over the details of the story in my mind, something struck me like a sack of bricks. In Mr. Mays' story, there was a silo near the barn. I ran outside, my eyes adjusting easily because at the very least it was brighter outside. I looked in all directions, running around the perimeter of the building. Surely, if there was ever a silo near this place, there would be some evidence of it somewhere. But despite my hopes, there was nothing but a cluster of thick bushes on one side, brush and dirt everywhere and the forest that we had come from. I walked back into the building, frustrated and tired. Steve was still pretty excited, eagerly running around the inside of the building. If we could just find a shower head or pipe, he said, then we'd know it was true. Just, just keep looking with me, okay? I didn't want to ruin his excitement. 
I had told Steve the story several times, but obviously he didn't realize that this just wasn't the place. The building was weird, yeah. It was out of place and oddly pristine, but it wasn't the location of the showers. I let him explore for a little bit before I called him over. Well, this is probably as close as we're going to get, man, I said. But this isn't it. Remember the silo? His face went from excitement to disappointment in an instant. Much like a young child who didn't get the presents he wanted on his birthday. I patted him on the shoulder. This is still pretty cool though. I mean, we could still tell people that we found it. I was reverting back to my old habits quickly. Steve laughed. <laughs> yeah man, I guess we could. It's definitely creepy enough. We could even get some pictures as proof, you know. I agreed with him. I'm going to go grab the camera real quick, okay? He said as he bolted out of the entrance of the building. I was left alone in there. It was very quiet when I was alone in there. I could hear the faint sound of Steve running through the bush and to the car, but once he was far enough away, everything was just dead quiet. I remember not even hearing wind or the chirping of crickets as I walked deeper into the dark, flashlight in hand. I was convinced that there had to be something. As I approached the far corner of the room, the sound of my feet scratching against the dirt was interrupted by a soft, hollow thud. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, I actually have some news for you guys. Audible reached out to me recently and is offering listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash scared and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. It's that easy. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash scared or text scared to 500 to get started today. That's A-U-D. I-B-L-E dot C-O-M slash S-C-A-R-E-D or text S-C-A-R-E-D to 500-500 to get started. Just so you guys know too, Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. In fact, one trilogy of books I can recommend to all of you guys are the Passage books by Justin Cronin. Of course, you can choose any book that you like, but if you're a fan of horror, then I think you'll love this series in particular. And the great thing about using Audible is that you can conveniently listen to great books like the Passage trilogy, on your way to work, school, while you're cooking, on a jog, at the gym, I mean literally just about anywhere. And that's what makes Audible so great. The convenience they offer is second to none, and couple that with the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet and a fantastic phone app to boot, and it seems like a no-brainer to give their 30-day free trial a go. Plus, your books are yours to keep. With Audible, you can go back and re-listen any time, even if you cancel your membership. So I hope you guys will take advantage of this generous offer and give Audible a try today. And without further ado, here's the rest of the story. I stopped trying to figure out what it was. I put my foot down hard against the ground and heard it again. I stomped one more time, realizing that the floor that I was standing on was covering something hollow below. I walked to the wall of the room, looking carefully at the floor to try and spot any holes or gaps. As far as I had known, it was solid ground that this thing sat atop, so... I was convinced that I had found a hatch or a basement or something. I heard Steve come back through the brush as I shouted. Hey Steve, come over here. It's hollow. As I went to say the word hollow, I hopped a little bit, hoping to recreate the sound so that he would be able to hear it upon entering the door. But the second that my feet made contact with the floor, I felt it give out beneath me. The memory of the fall is fuzzy, but I do recall hearing wood splinter. I remember seeing the light from Steve's flashlight falling away into complete darkness. 
It wasn't a long fall, but I must have fallen into a terrible position because I know that I lost consciousness for several seconds at least. When I woke up, I was staring at a bright light. For an instant, I had thoughts about approaching the fabled light at the end of the tunnel. I was angry at myself. You died in Nebraska, Jack? Wow, you do know how to fuck up. My self-deprecation, though, in the afterlife was interrupted by what sounded like Steve's voice. Oh, shit. Jack? Jack? Can you hear me, dude? Wake up! Please, man, you've got to wake up! He said, down into the hole. I managed to lift my head up off the floor, just enough for him to celebrate. The pain in my head was immense, but it was outweighed by the pain shooting through my knee. I knew that I had a concussion, but the pain in my knee was just so much more pressing. I looked around until I found my tiny flashlight, and then sat up and reassured Steve. I'm okay, dude. I've just hurt my knee. I bumped my head really hard too, dude. Oh, thank fuck, man. I thought you were dead. Imagine that, though. Dying in fucking Nebraska. It'd be awful. His words made me laugh a little bit, but I stopped myself. The slightest shaking hurt my head and made me incredibly dizzy. Ah, uh, I guess we need a rope, right? Said Steve. Ah, uh, what? I asked, quietly. Uh, should I go get a rope to get you out of here? Or do you see a ladder or something down there? I looked around the walls that sat in front of me. They were smooth cement. There was no way that I was climbing out of here. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, get a rope, I told him. It's, I think it's buried under all the stuff. It might be in my red climbing bag, but I'm not too sure. Steve nodded, telling me to hang in there and that he'd be back in a little bit. And then he just ran off. The silence that followed was uncomfortable. After the sound of Steve's feet scraping the floor above me faded away, I was only able to hear that buzzing that occurs in total silence, intertwined with the pulsing in my head. I pushed myself over to the nearest cement wall and braced myself against it, resting and breathing deep in an attempt to calm myself. The cement was unnaturally cold against my back. It was summer, so... I only had a t-shirt on, but it felt like ice even through that. Again, this observation was primarily made after the fact. In the moment, it just felt good to lean against something. I sat there, waiting for Steve in this underground basement, and I began to feel uneasy. I felt like an idiot for falling down here. I felt pain from my injuries as well. But that all seemed to fade into one emotion in an instant when I heard what I could only identify as breathing somewhere to my left. I convinced myself that it was my injured mind playing tricks on me for a moment until my mind decided to rapidly replay Mr. May's story. When I had first heard it in that classroom years before, I was more impressed than I was scared. But now, sitting in a dark basement in the middle of Nebraska, I felt something that I hadn't felt in a long time. It couldn't even be summed up in the word fear. As I sat there, I felt an all-encompassing dread. I pointed my flashlight to my left, the direction from which I thought I heard the sound. The light it didn't reach the other wall. It was too far away. But I was comforted to see absolutely nothing there. I breathed deeply for a couple more seconds before I heard another noise in the darkness. It was really quick and I can't be sure that it wasn't my own body moving around without my noticing. But I thought that I heard a scraping sound not ten feet in front of me. It sounded like the noise your feet make when you're walking across a dirt-covered floor. Before I could react, 
I heard the breathing to my left again, closer this time. There was no way that this was real, right? I hadn't seen so much as a spider web in this building, and now I was convincing myself that something next to me was breathing. I was angry at myself for getting so worked up. I told myself that the human brain is constantly hallucinating. I told myself that while in silence or darkness, the brain will make sounds to fill the gap or make you think or see things that just aren't there. I channeled my inner skeptic in order to calm myself down. And it worked. It worked until I saw a flash of something in front of me. I can't be entirely sure what it was, but I heard the accompanying sounds of feet scraping against the floor and... I began to swell with dread. I decided that the best course of action at this point was to turn off my flashlight, assuming that if they couldn't see me, they couldn't get me, whatever they might be. I turned off my flashlight and was left in complete and total darkness. The bulb of the flashlight faded as it cooled and I put it into my pocket, simultaneously pushing back against the cold cement wall in an attempt to stand. I managed to get up onto my feet, well, foot, and found that I couldn't stand or put any pressure on my injured knee. I limped to the corner, humming to myself, trying to break the deafening silence. I called for Steve as loud as I could manage, but I heard no response. He was probably in the back of the car, still hunting for the rope. There had to be a ladder or something somewhere to get out of here, right? I continued to hum, and my heartbeat, which had been beating almost out of my chest, slowed to a manageable rate. I moved along the cement wall, keeping my whole body against it and weight off of my injured knee. I had travelled what I guessed to be about ten feet when my head made contact with something in front of me. I tumbled to the ground. My concussion must have amplified the pain because it was blinding. I reached both hands to my forehead when I felt something warm and wet with my fingers. I searched for a cut anywhere on my forehead, but I couldn't find one. I desperately searched for my flashlight as I sat up and tried to get back against the wall. I grabbed the light in my right hand, bracing against the wall with the other. I turned it on and pointed it into the darkness where I was just laying. The floor was wet, but the dirt had muddled the color of whatever the liquid was. I tried to get my eyes to focus on the puddle, tried to convince myself that it was my blood when I saw another drop fall into the puddle. Words lacked the ability to describe the way I felt when I heard the drip noise again and saw yet another tiny ball of liquid fall into the puddle. I think I knew, even then, exactly what the source was, but I was endlessly trying to convince myself that I was wrong. I lifted the flashlight up and pointed it at the source of the liquid. What stared back at me was a pipe that protruded at least a foot out from the cement wall. The metal was rusted and cracked, Little bits of the liquid began to seep from them even. And at the end of the pipe was a simple shower head aimed down towards the ground. You know that feeling when your stomach drops? In this case, I think mine literally did because I vomited immediately. It got all over my shoe, but that wasn't the least bit important at the time. I ignored the pain in my knee and shuffled along the wall as fast as I possibly could. I heard noises, but I can't be sure if it was just the sounds of my own movement or something else around me. I managed to duck under the shower head. This one was higher up on the wall and seemed to be leaking the same liquid that the other one was. I felt like I was moving along something infinite. Every now and then... I would have to duck or move under another metal bar, another shower head. They began to pour more profusely, but the liquid was too thick to come out easily. And the room? 
it began to smell. I remembered immediately the way that Mr. Mays had described it. I grabbed my shirt and put it over my nose, trucking onward, but it didn't stop the smell for an instant. It smelled like vomit. It smelled like shit. It smelled like burnt hair. It smelled like... like... rot. I was still moving fast against the wall when I fell into some sort of outlet. I hit the dirt ground hard, adrenaline coursing through my veins. The pain still managed to break through though. My flashlight was still in my hand and I aimed it and examined my surroundings. Sitting in front of me was a doorway. There was a door there, though it looked aged now. It had a nice little design on it too. A doorknob and a knocker that looked like a snarling demon. Red paint was peeling from it, flaking off and falling to the ground in front of me. I clumsily rose and busted through the door, narrowly missing a piece of hanging sheet metal in front of me. I was crawling now. There was no way that I could run. The walls and ceiling were lined with metal, the kind that you would see on the roof of a farm. Large pieces of wood seemed to brace the sheets, holding this makeshift tunnel together. I couldn't risk sliding against that and possibly cutting myself in the metal, or hitting the wood and causing a cave-in, so I crawled. I pulled myself for what felt like miles, running into walls every now and then, because the path seemed to curve like a snake. I had no idea where I was in relation to the hole that I'd fallen through, but... I told myself that there was an exit at the end of this. Had I not been crawling, I would have surely hurt myself far worse. There were parts of the tunnel in which the ceiling dipped down to maybe three feet above the ground. It hadn't caved in because the ceiling still lined it. Someone had built it like this. This, again, is all in hindsight. At the time, I didn't care. I just kept telling myself that there was nothing behind me, but I swore that I heard feet scraping only a few inches beyond my own. My jeans would brush against my legs every now and then, making it feel like someone was touching me. And even now, I still can't completely convince myself that someone wasn't. I crawled and crawled until I reached an upslope. With joy, I looked ahead of me, there was a cellar door. The door was made of wood. I knew this because I could see the light around them. I couldn't be sure, but I thought it might have been the light from the car headlights. Besides all of that, I was just so immensely happy to find an exit. I crawled all the way to the door and threw my shoulder into it. It budged, but it didn't open. I began to scream, but my throat seared with pain. The most I could manage was a harsh crying noise. It sounded like a dying animal, if I'm being honest. I collapsed in exhaustion and pain, my eyes staring up at the slits of light before me. I was so close to being out of here that I could taste it. It was in that moment of silent defeat that I heard a noise that was, without question something moving in the tunnel. It sounded like something was being dragged across the floor. It would move, pause for a second, and then move again. I had nothing left in my stomach to throw up, but I began to gag. I gathered myself slightly and tried to steady my hand enough to focus the flashlight in the tunnel. But what I saw... I I still can not rationalize. I know what I saw, but I can't convince myself that it was actually there. I can't stop telling myself that I was hallucinating. I saw a child in a dirty sleeping gown. The gown was stained with something dark and brown, with occasional splashes of deep red. The child was extremely frail, like the pictures people might see of a holocaust victim or something. I could only make out one eye, brightly reflecting the light of my flashlight, 
in between two huge tufts of long, dirty hair. It reached down beyond the fingertips of the child, which were caked with dirt. The boy or girl, I'm not entirely sure which, moved towards me with difficulty. It wasn't breathing hard, but it seemed that every movement of every muscle took every ounce of strength the child had. The thing that froze me, though, was the eye. It was only visible because it was reflecting my flashlight, but even in that glint, I could feel anger or deep hatred or something like it. This... This is the point in which the English language really lacks the right words to explain the situation. I could tell that this child, it meant me harm. Whether it was a hallucination or not, the thing was getting closer too. I started to cry. It was getting closer and closer when I heard a voice from behind me. Hey, Jack! It was... It was Steve. I was certain. I tried to talk back, fully intending to say, open this up and get me out of here. However, given my current state, I'm sure it just sounded like garbled nonsense. I clawed at the door, pushing against it with everything that I had and finally breaking eye contact with the child. As I did this, the flashlight rolled down the slope, coming to rest somewhere near the child's feet. Do you see? The voice asked me. What are you talking about? I closed my eyes. I remember hearing a reply along the lines of, just look at it, tell me what you see. But my own screams of frustration drowned it out. I was mumbling like a maniac when the voice told me calmly. Rest for a second. I'll get it. The statement took a second to settle in, at which point I closed my eyes tight. Steve, just do it please. Please, just get it open. Hurry. I whimpered. Just get me out of here, man. My voice was beginning to get louder. Steve, Steve, for fuck's sake, open the wooden door. I opened my eyes for a split second to see nothing but black hair dangling in front of my face, a small glint of light hidden in the massive tangles. I slammed my eyes shut and screamed with every ounce of energy that I had to open the door, and the door finally gave way, and I fell onto the dirt, taking in the breath of fresh air. And my eyes were still closed, but the first thing I did was scramble to find the cellar door and close it. Once I had done that, I took a deep breath and opened my eyes. I saw the barn in front of me, illuminated by the headlights of the car. My head was pulsing with pain and I was covered in dirt and liquids that I didn't even care to know the origin of. My knee was at the very least dislocated, but despite all of that, I was finally out of that damn tunnel. I took a deep breath, buried my head in my hands and said, Steve, why didn't you just fucking open the door, man? I waited for a response, but none came. Steve, seriously, I began. I was fucking clawing and screaming for my life, I said as I looked behind me. My stomach must have been on the verge of falling out of me at this point because it shifted again. The only thing behind me was the large mass of bushes that I had seen while examining the perimeter of the building. I was angry. Steve! This is not the fucking time, man! Come out of the fucking bushes now! I was getting ready to stand up when I heard a yell from the front of the building. A flashlight bobbed up and down in the semi-darkness. Steve was running into the open door of the structure, yelling my name and telling me not to worry. I must have lost consciousness at that point, because when I woke up, Steve was standing over me, desperately trying to wake me up. His words were almost incoherent, at least to my ears. 
He helped me to my feet and we began to walk to the car. And as we walked away, I saw my flashlight sitting just outside of the cellar door. And the light was fading. Steve brought me back to the car and then drove me to the nearest hospital. I fell asleep, but he told me that he drove around for an hour before he found a main road. I don't think that I ever told him the whole story. I believe he thinks that I was just injured from the fall. He never really asked about it, and we didn't stay in contact for much longer. It's not like we deliberately parted ways. We just sort of stopped hanging out after that trip and went our separate ways. I have never been able to fully understand what happened that night. There are many things that I can explain away as being hallucinations, but... There are still many things that just don't make any sense. The shower heads, they were there and they were leaking something. The door was real. The tunnel was real. Most everything else can be semi-rationalized if I can convince myself that I had a very bad concussion. A very, very bad one at that. But the thing that I don't think I could have imagined was that the cellar door was locked. And then, all of a sudden, it wasn't. I am still as skeptical as I have ever been, but I believe in what happened to me at the showers. I'm not a hermit or a social retard because of this. I drink a lot, but I'm definitely still functional. But I will never return to Nebraska. And no one will ever be able to convince me otherwise, too. I don't watch horror movies either anymore, because there's absolutely nothing entertaining to me about being so desperately scared anymore. And that's... that's it really. There's no typical ending for my story. I was changed by my experience, yeah, but there is no way to change anything about it or fight back against it. I can't even convince myself that... I wasn't just seeing things. But believe me, I've been trying to tell myself this for years. But prior to this, there was really no way to find any information on the showers. The legend didn't extend outside of the classroom of Mr. Mays. No one told stories like this to keep children away from a certain place or scare them. It just wasn't known about. I guess that's really the whole point of this story too. I want people to know, firsthand, what this place is like. Maybe, maybe it's a, a drunk's rationale, or the kid inside me wanting to spread these kinds of stories again. I don't know, and I don't care. But, it's, it's out there now, for people to mold and warp to their own needs. And most importantly, it's finally out of my own head. It's getting late now, and I'm going to go and get another drink. Cheers. G'day, mates. It's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family, and on social media too. Thanks again for listening, guys, and I'll see you, mates, in the next one. G'day, mates. It's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest-growing, highest-rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favorite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. The Showers Part 3 by Clover10176 
My name is Jack, and some of you may have read or heard a story about me, by me, a few years back. I'm writing this from the same shitty laptop that I used to drunkenly post the showers on Reddit a little over five years ago. It spent the better part of two years at the bottom of a box in my bedroom closet. I haven't had much use for it recently, and it honestly isn't in the best shape. I mean... The damn thing takes about 20 minutes to start up properly and dies the instant it unplugs from its charger. Some of the keys are missing, some of the stick. I've spent a good amount of time clumsily cleaning soft drinks cut with whiskey out of every nook and cranny. But a thing can only take so much abuse before it just goes, I guess. But tonight, I got lucky. She managed to boot, just for me. And I think that... She may have one more decent story left in her, for better or worse. I don't really remember writing or posting either part of the showers. I do, however, remember feeling simultaneously listless and restless around that time period. I was tremendously unproductive, not working in my chosen field, and had too much free time to spend thinking about these facts. I had told the story to some friends at the bar one night and shaken some memories loose, which led to that post. I woke up one evening and hopped on my laptop to find that the story thread was left open. I had typed it directly into submission box, not leaving myself anything to edit. I just forced it off of me over a couple of long, drunken nights and threw it up on the internet for everyone to see. I tried to read it, but even outside of the memories that I would have rather avoided. Each spelling and grammatical error made me want to shoot whiskey or chug bleach. I went with the former, and as far as I can remember, I've never made it through the whole story as it was written. It seems pointless to go back and read it even now. I've lived through this all enough times in my head. I don't need to do that to myself again. I did read the comments, though. I may have hated myself, but seeing a bit of interest in my work gave my ego a boost, if only for a moment. I went back every now and then to check on them, but for the most part, I was forced to continue with my stagnant life while the story spread quietly around the web. I worked as a bartender at the time and split my free hours between sleeping and drinking. These occasionally overlapped or synced up with work. It was a, a vicious little loop that I'd carved for myself. I wasn't a writer like I'd hoped to be at that point in my life, so getting to play one on the internet for a few minutes every now and then helped me to break up the monotony of reality. Over the course of the next several months, I received several emails and friend requests from old classmates or strangers who had taken an interest in my story. My former classmates' messages generally consisted of their memories of Mr. Mays and his story, asking nothing in return. I had guessed that most of them were either married or lost and needed a dose of nostalgia as a pick-me-up. And I mean, who could blame them? Though, some of them actually wanted to meet up, grab drinks and really get into the past. I lived half a continent away from the town where I attended Mr. May's class at this point, but that didn't stop me from making empty offers of company to several different people, if our paths were to ever cross that is. I did end up grabbing a beer with one guy who was just passing through on some summer night in Denver, but it wasn't what I was expecting. I'm 99% sure that he had never met Mr. Mays or myself. He dodged specifics when I asked him questions, and repeated a lot of my own statements back to me in agreement. I remember him nodding his head a lot and saying, yeah, that's right, over and over again but he was picking up the tab, so I didn't notice a lot of this until the next afternoon. And that was also the last time that I met up with anyone from the internet. I also got a surprising number of requests for the specific coordinates of the showers from a wide variety of personalities. There were people even offering money, transport, and even what was essentially militia support if I would take them there, like it was some sort of guided tour or something. I turned them down, but would be lying if I said that I didn't consider accepting some cash in exchange for the coordinates of any random barn that I could pull up on Google Maps. But I didn't, though. As foreign and surreal as the whole thing was, 
I did take pretty immediate notice of the power it gave me over people. It felt like I was back around a campfire with a group of friends, hanging on my every word, but with a much larger audience. It all started innocently enough, too. I would be out with a friend, looking for some decent conversation or a better lay. My friend would bring up the showers and ask me to tell the story. Then I would fight him on it for a bit, before caving, ordering another round and launching into some variation of the bit. And... It really did work like a charm. It seemed like every time I went out, I ended up with a new friend or another notch on my belt. I hardly had to try even. I was just drunkily wandering down memory lane. After a while, I had narrowed my sights, only binging out the story for certain people for very specific ends. I used it to get laid. It's as simple as that. I would talk to a girl for a little while, and get to know her just enough, take a guess at some of her fears, and work them into the climax of the story. I have faced down ghosts, encountered demons, and even had spiders rain down on me from the shower heads. But I made it out intact every time, if only ever so slightly worse for wear. I was just damaged enough from the experience that a pretty girl might feel some sympathy for me which I would thank her for while reaching out for her hands or grabbing her leg. All roads led to the same place. Hers. I would stumble back to my barren apartment every afternoon, throw on some different clothes and head back out to the bar. Whether it was for work or play, that didn't really matter. Like I said, all roads. I, uh... I don't know how long I spent in this piece of shit phase, but I do know that Karen broke me out of it. Initially, she was just the next in a long line of women that I had yet to woo. We met at a bar where I told her a story which led to her place, but instead of passing out after sex, we stayed up and talked. It didn't feel like needless bullshit either. I felt like she understood me and I heard. In reality, I think we just both liked getting really messed up and swapping stories about our shitty childhoods and mental ailments with someone else so that we wouldn't have to make excuses for being alone. We actually did have the mental stuff in common, though. Two different kinds of bipolar disorder. We thought that in some strange way it meant that we were perfect for each other. I don't need to be told how stupid that sounds, I know. Karen also had a degree in political science from Rutgers, a wicked right hook, and one of the most persuasive and charismatic personalities that I had ever encountered. I worry that that sort of thing isn't going to come across here because of what this is all ultimately leading to. I don't want to do her a disservice. I mean, we didn't end up together for a year and a half because we were awful for each other. At that point in my life... I was both lost and an asshole. I had turned her into a concept or an archetype in my head. She was the Nancy to my Sid, the Bonnie to my Clyde, and we were probably headed down the same path as both couples. I guess, looking back, that I had fit her into that awful manic pixie dream girl trope in my head. I was a lost guy looking for a girl with hair the color of a mood ring to solve the complex problem that was me. On any given day, she was the love of my life and my partner in crime. The next day, she was my antagonist, an obstacle to overcome. It was all part of this story that I had seen play out in movies and books so many times before. But in the end, it was me trying to fit a square peg into a non-existent hole. She made me feel good about myself, though. I'm pretty sure that... I even loved her. It's just that I was simultaneously loving and using her without really realizing what I was doing. This isn't to say that she didn't get any use out of me, though. She started coming over to my place after we had spent a couple of nights together and never really left. Items of her clothing and her toiletries started showing up around the apartment, and I just kind of went with it. 
There was one night where I had brought up how we had never actually talked about living together before it had already happened. That night somehow ended with both of us blacking out in tears. But by the time that happy hour had rolled around the next evening, we were as good as new. It wasn't an issue at the time, we just sort of fell in together. I know that this probably sounds unhealthy, and uh, to be honest, I guess it was. Anyway, I've gotten off track. Karen took an interest in my stories. Uh, the showers particularly interested her because she had come across a reading of it on a podcast or YouTube channel and knew about it before she'd even met me. She thought that I was messing with her at the bar, trying to take credit for a story someone else had lived. But I was able to convince her and she didn't let go after that. After long nights, we would lay in bed together and she would ask me to tell her the story again like some sort of morbid bedtime story. Each time I told it to her, I would embellish a little more or shake loose a new memory pulled from deep within my imagination. I don't know if she actually believed it or if she just wanted to, but it became our thing. But of course, the story eventually wasn't enough. She wanted to live it. Hey Jack, can, can we go there? Let's go to the showers. She wanted us to go together and face them down like some sort of boss fight. She constantly told me that it would be good for me to go back there and get perspective. She was convinced that it would help me pick up writing again. Karen always told me that I had such good ideas, but that something held me back from letting them loose. She genuinely wanted to help me, but I couldn't see how this would do any of that. And now it seems even more obvious. I think another aspect of her interest in the showers was just honest fixation. We both had a tendency to key in on a particular subject and dig deep into it until there was nothing of interest left to cover. This meant that her attention generally burned intensely before quickly fizzling out. My refusal to indulge her one last wish and take her there kept her going, I think. She would strategically pick the moments where... I was just drunk enough to loosen my lips, but not so drunk that I was off in my own world to ask about the place. Occasionally, she would bring up a piece of information that I had told her about the showers while blacked out that would resonate with me enough to put my arm hair on edge. Even if I couldn't conjure the memory while sober, my body recognized it. I knew that she was getting closer to something in me that I didn't want to address but I never stopped her outright. To be honest, though, I don't know if I even believed my own story anymore. I just felt a, a bit sick when I thought about it. But she persisted, using every method in the book to try and convince me to take her there. Every new detail, real or otherwise, would motivate her to push me harder on the subject. It was the middle of winter when I finally caved. We were living in Fort Collins, Colorado at this time, which was only a short drive from Broken Bow, Nebraska. I had still maintained my ground when it came to making a trip there, claiming that I didn't remember that we didn't have the time and that I had forgotten exactly how to get to the farmhouse, which were both partially true, if I'm being honest. But, like I said, she knew when she could get me best. We were sat on the couch following a long night of bar hopping and friend drama. Luckily, we had found ourselves on the same side of this particular situation, which meant that the night was going to close quietly. We were snuggled together under a blanket and watching some movie. Well, Karen was watching while I split my time between nodding off and attempting to read screenplays that a friend of mine had sent to me. I had seen the film a dozen and a half times at this point. In it, a struggling folk singer loses his way after his partner commits suicide. Spoilers, sorry. <laughs> Karen and I shared a mutual fascination with the subject of suicide, so it was only a matter of time before one of us said something. You know, 
I would hate to jump off a bridge like that, I think, she said. I mean, there's a chance that you'd live when you're hitting the water and you'd wind up, like, paralyzed or something. I guess I'd feel like an even bigger waste of space if I couldn't even kill myself properly. I wasn't sure if she actually wanted to get into it or not, but I did. I couldn't jump, I said, pulling her closely and closing my eyes. That's way too much build-up and pressure. Too much time to regret it when falling. It wasn't a taboo subject with us. It's difficult to explain to those unfamiliar with lifelong suicidal ideation, but discussing it in blunt and honest terms is kind of comforting in a way. When faced with it every single day, familiarizing oneself with something typically viewed as morbid was its own sort of victory. We shined a light on it. Know your enemy and whatnot, right? Yeah, even if it were concrete or lava below me, I couldn't do it. I don't want anything flashy, honestly. Give me benzos and a couple of pints of shivers and I'll go gentle, I said. Yeah, maybe I would jump, Karen thought out loud. But I do it out of a plane. I just want that one last rush of adrenaline, you know? Well, you could stay alive and get a lot more of that, I replied. Nah, not with those kinds of stakes. She had a point. Well, I just want to be quiet. Now let me drink myself to death with a book and some relaxing music to play me out. I sighed. Probably some bright eyes. I don't know. Karen was quiet for a while after this. A character in the film overdosed in a bathroom stall and she spoke up. I just don't want to go like that. At the very least, I'd want to be around friends or even family if no one else is available. I was nodding off at this point. Maybe kind of like your teacher. I stirred at this. She hadn't brought up the story in a while, and when she did, she never led into it with Mr. Mays. Eh, I guess, I said. If I fell asleep, she would be forced to leave it be for tonight. Come on, let's go, bub, she said. Go where? You know. And I knew. Uh, the liquor store's closed. I grumbled. No, Nebraska. It's late. Well, we could go next week. I'll take it off work. I'll get someone to drive us. Why would anyone want to drive us to Nebraska? Well, Brian seems interested. In Nebraska? In your story. You could write about it. I mean, it's been a while since you've written I could bring my camera. From the way you described it, I'm pretty sure that I can get some good pictures. I was getting uncomfortable at this point, but that was offset by my exhaustion. Listen, I don't want to go. I didn't put up much of a fight, though. Please, for me. We never go anywhere and the apartment gets stuffy. And plus, it's my birthday next month. Ah. <sighs> Fine, okay, all right, I said, trying to appease her so that I could drift off. But what about the cat? And the next thing I knew, we were packed up and leaving the comforts of home for Nebraska. G'day, mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favor to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's B-I-S-H dot B-U-S-T-A at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in. And without further ado... Here's the rest of the story. I had said yes to the trip and then fallen asleep. 
By the time I woke up the following afternoon, Karen had already secured one of her friends as our chauffeur and was requesting time off of work that fit with my schedule. She was actually really happy and I was on quite a bit of Xanax but I wanted to keep the good times rolling. With our schedules and switching moods, happy was sometimes hard to come by. So I thought about that as we packed up my car. I was asleep before we made it out of town. I woke up in another dimension. The view out my window was an icy tundra that hurt my eyes. I hadn't seen that much sun in months and the ice amplified it. Our friend Brian was behind the wheel of my shitty 2004 Ford Escape as we flew down the interstate towards Broken Bow. Everyone called him the responsible one in our group of friends because he wouldn't get behind the wheel after drinking any booze at all. What only Karen and I knew was that he would be high as a kite while driving us all home and telling how he was the only one of us destined for a DUI. But he hadn't been in any accidents yet, so we didn't say a word. But Karen sat shotgun with a sonic cup in her lap. If I knew her, which I did... She had poured out three quarters of her drink and filled the rest of the cup with vodka. She noticed after a minute that I had woken up. Hey bub, sleep well? She asked, turning around in her seat to face me. A vapor of vodka with a hint of cherry flooded my nostrils and burned my eyes. But Karen refused to travel long distances without what she affectionately called a roadie. She had adopted the term from her late father who had killed himself when she was only 14. And her preoccupation with suicide had at least come from somewhere logical. She had always idolized Randy, her dad, and hadn't spoken to her mother in a decade. She had told me this story often, frequently reinforcing the idea that many of her idiosyncrasies, her bad habits that related to Randy were exempt from criticism and so I made my only sensible move in this situation hey did you get me one extra cup is for you my dear half and half she winked and handed me the styrofoam cup of cure all I needed it my jaw was absolutely throbbing at this point I've always had a problem with grinding my teeth in my sleep it was so bad growing up that my canines actually grew outward like vampire teeth. It hadn't been an issue in some time. I figured that the previous night of partying, alongside the anxiety about the trip, had just taken a toll. I took a sip of the drink and winced. It was about one quarter limeade to three quarters cheap vodka. <sighs> Burnett? I groaned. I guess it fits the scenery. Karen laughed. Nothing except the frost-covered remains of last season's harvest and frozen dirt surrounded us for miles. I stared out over the miles of repetitious backdrop for a couple of hours. Barren earth occasionally gave way to tufts of shorn trees that reached futilely towards the grey heavens above, and they were seemingly ignored. They now resembled petrified roots that had aggressively snuffed out any hint of life that had once inhabited their numbers. Every now and then, I was able to spot the rusting remnants of a vehicle or a crumbling shed hidden amongst the branches, surely soon to be overtaken by the vindictive woodland. The three of us passed the time by fiddling with a barely functioning tape to auxiliary cord converter so that we could play music off of our phones. Unfortunately, even when we had gotten that to work, it was still a crapshoot thanks to spotty 4G connection on the planes. Karen and I chain smoked camel menthol cigarettes, much to Brian's chagrin. He smoked too, but would only touch the baby blue packs of American spirits, which were all natural and burned for an eternity. Smoking anything else, he believed, was just asking for cancer. The drive was familiar and we had been wandering through foggy memories of my last trip to Broken Bow. I was frustrated and getting a bit uncomfortable because of the haze, so I had to drink about it. 
and my own head was keeping me in the dark. And Brian and Karen, despite having heard the story of the showers ten times by this point, prodded me for new details once we had crossed the state line into Nebraska. I managed to dodge their inquisition by telling them how it was a violation of tradition to listen to a band while on the way to the concert. This did ease the pressure a bit, but my teeth were grinding and my jaw was aching. <sighs> this place was bringing something out at me, leaving me anxious and reflexively defensive. Brian had grown up in New Jersey, and despite the relative emptiness of the two-lane highway, he was driving like he was still there. I had no problem with sweeping across the plains with a signal, speeding or rapidly jerking left and right to exit the interstate on any regular day. As uncomfortable as it might have been to avoid the eye contact of an angry truck driver that Brian had cut off, we always got to our destination significantly faster than the GPS estimated. However, today, his highway practices, they were making me queasy. The honks from several angry passerby got to be too much, and I threw on my headphones and pulled my beanie over my eyes in an attempt at sensory deprivation. I ended up drifting off after a little bit. I had a dream that felt vaguely familiar, but... I hadn't remembered my dreams in years, so I couldn't be sure. I was back at the bar I frequented during college, the same place where I last met Mr. Mays almost a decade ago. The voices of the faceless patrons around the two of us were muted. I sat next to my deceased former teacher, who was sporting a sweater that read, I'm the birthday boy. Mr. Mays looked up at me from a drink, eyes bloodshot from holding his booze and holding back tears. He didn't say anything, but I slowly recalled the conversation between the two of us from years ago, which rang through my head loud enough to fill the silence. I remembered his friend, the one they had lost. Mr. Mays looked away from me and into his drink, and he didn't look back up. But then... I heard a noise like dripping water that echoed around the bar. Looking in front of me, I found a highball glass that was filled to the brim with what I guessed was whiskey. Without a second thought, I threw it back. It didn't sit well and I pursed my lips and sat back on the table as the lights around the bar began to dim from the outside in. I rubbed my eyes and breathed deeply to quell the nausea, but... It wasn't working. The room continued to dim as the dripping noise rang out around me once again. I looked up at the glass before me to find it filled again, the liquid still rippling from a recent pour. Another drop fell from above, breaking the surface tension and spilling drink all over the bar top. I looked up to see a shower head hanging just beyond the light, dripping liquid. The sound of Violently shaking pipes echoed around me, and the shower head began to shake. It began to erupt, just as I was pulled back to reality with a jolt. I panicked and thrashed about for a moment. My knee and arm cracked as I moved about, adjusting once again to the real world. Whoa, bubs, easy now, said Karen with a chuckle. We had parked at a rest stop. Brian must have pulled in too quickly and hit the curb, which is what had woken me up. I tasted a cherry limeade crawling up the back of my throat and felt my stomach rumble. We're outside of Hastings, don't know how far. You better use the restroom now or forever hold your peace, said Karen. I opened the car door and the icy wind pushed it against me, slamming my foot into the door. Annoyed, I pushed back and rushed across the lot to the surprisingly bustling rest area. I did my business and washed my hands, attempting to ignore the leaking shower heads in the stalls at the back of the room. I felt every drop in my chest. I hadn't had anxiety like this in ages. The nausea had come with me from the dream and I gagged slightly at the sink. I closed my eyes and breathed deeply, pulling a flask from my jacket pocket and 
looking around me to gauge the judgment that I was about to receive. The truckers around me didn't take a second look, but a father who was changing his infant at the station near the but a father who was changing his infant at the station near the door, he shot me a look. But maybe he didn't. I'm not sure why I cared. I mean, it wasn't going to stop me. One of the showers in the back turned onto full blast. I took a pull from the flask and, unlike my dream, my stomach relaxed and gagging ceased. I cleared my throat of whatever had built up prior to the nip of whiskey and spit it into the sink. It was a bright shade of red. I didn't panic though. I just needed to eat at some point. I pushed back through the line of people that had gathered at the restroom door and jogged out back to the car. Karen was sitting inside with the window cracked, holding a dying cigarette halfway at the window. When she saw me, she flicked it out and rolled the window up, gesturing for me to hurry up. I hopped inside and we were back on the interstate within seconds. Don't fall asleep on us again, okay, bub? We're going to need you to steer us from here, I think, Karen said. Just get us to Broken Bow, I said, staring out over some of the harvested fields that looked like they had been burnt. I'll guide us from there, okay? We continued down the interstate for a while while Brian and Karen sung songs and I sat in the back seat, working to try and ground myself. Uh, we're going to need some gas if we're going to go hunting for this place in the boonies, said Brian. He broke my concentration. Well, there's only about 10 gas stations in the entire state, so mix it where you can, I said. I caught the tail end of a sign that read Broken Bow, but didn't catch the other information. Within minutes, Brian was exiting the highway and pulling into what appeared to be a gas station. It had pumps at the front and a small convenience store, but behind it was a rickety single-story house. The design was Victorian, but it was faded and chipped to all hell. Some of the windows appeared to be busted in too, the hole stuffed with assorted clothes and rags. I felt a a sense of recognition as I stepped out of the car and began to pump gas. Karen was running inside to grab snacks as Brian shouted after her. Hey, Karen, get me some sunflower seeds, he yelled. She was already inside. Brian looked at me. You're Jack, sunflower seeds? Please, and thanks, man. He closed the door behind him before I was able to tell him that I wasn't going inside. I grumbled as I walked into the old station. O'Brien was driving us, so I couldn't get too upset with embarking orders, I guess. I was just irritable and all over the place. The building had a familiar musty smell to it that, much to my surprise, started to help clear away some of the fog that had been bugging me. I was pretty sure that I had been to this particular gas station before. I figured that was pretty likely, considering where we were at and the aforementioned lack of stops in the area. It was a neat coincidence, and that's what I told myself. Karen was up at the counter, cheerily chatting with a young girl who couldn't have been much older than 18 about something or other. The girl was talking to Karen, but staring daggers at me the entire time. She wasn't even subtle about it, in fact. I figured that I looked nervous and sweaty, so I didn't blame her for keeping an eye on me. But it still made me uncomfortable, and I found myself grinding my teeth again. I was attempting to work the pain out of my jaw muscles with my knuckle while aimlessly wandering the aisles when Karen asked the young lady at the counterpoint, blank. So, what do you know about the showers? The woman didn't miss a beat. Well... People don't deal with anything relating to that sort of business around here anymore, she said. My legs locked up and I turned my head towards her. She was staring directly at me despite Karen being directly in front of her. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Her eyes remained locked on me. I felt the pain in my jaw pulse and my stomach lurched. This was not possible. 
consciously and unconsciously, I was rejecting the overwhelming feeling of deja vu. I held my stomach and refused to look up at the woman, but I could feel her gaze on me still as Karen pressed her unsuccessfully for more information. I managed to get through the door and locked it behind me, before falling to my knees and onto the toilet that sat only a few feet in front of me. I could feel my stomach clench tightly over and over again, but nothing was coming out. I was violently dry heaving and struggling to breathe. With the pressure behind my eyes and skull building, I forced a finger down my throat. I thought that if I could just get whatever this was out of me, I would feel so much better. I was choking on my own finger and seeing stars, eyes on the verge of bursting before I just gave up. I didn't need to pass out in a gas station bathroom. That sounded way too close to rock bottom for comfort. I sat back, my body lightly glazed with sweat and concentrated hard on a number of deep breaths in an effort to get my vision to stabilize. It was a, a half-assed version of a grounding technique for anxiety that I had picked up at some point. I could feel the pressure release as I wiped away the torrent of tears that had wet my face. My eyes finally focused on a green picture frame next to the mirror above the sink. The picture frame read, You can't choose them, you just gotta love them, and featured what appeared to be three generations of women laughing while posing outside of a large green farmhouse. The youngest of the three I recognized as the woman at the counter just outside. Next to her was what I guessed to be her mother. Next to the mother was someone familiar. It was a sweet old woman in a sundress, the same dress that she had been wearing when I had ventured into this shop with my friend Steve many years ago. The three of us had a, a nice conversation about the town and our post-college trip until our motives for staying in Broken Bow were made clear. When she found out that we were in search of the showers, her demeanor changed and she had given us a, a stern and very measured answer. I got to my feet, my head spinning and splashed some water onto my face. I had a, a burst capillary in my right eye. It was blood red, dilated and raining tears. I looked like a mess if I'm being honest, but I didn't care. After spitting up a bit of red into the sink again, I walked out into the hallway, shooting one last glance at the picture just to make sure that I wasn't losing my mind. It was still the same old woman, but I was definitely losing my mind. I quickly made my way towards the front door, knocking bags of sunflower seeds and sticks of jerky onto the floor. Karen was still talking with the girl at the counter, and the girl was no longer looking at me. But was she ever? If I didn't know Karen, I would have assumed that she was hitting on the girl, but... That's just how she was. She had a way with people. Hey, uh, are you feeling okay? Karen looked me up and down with a concerned look on her face. The girl at the counter stared at her. Hey, did you get sick? I looked at Karen, the girl, and Karen again. Out towards the car and back to Karen. Uh, I must have just eaten something bad. I said, glancing up at the girl. Uh, a bad stomach. The medications. She looked at me and calmly nodded, understandingly. She seemed to sense that something else was going on, but I didn't care. Uh, thanks, and uh, have a good day, I said, bolting out of the door. The bell above me rang, and I could feel it in my jaw. Karen followed after giving the girl a sort of excuse for my behavior. Hey, hey. Karen caught up with me before I got to the car. Hey, what's up with you? I'm just, uh, I'm tired, I said. She saw through that. Listen, I just, I took a nip that went down the wrong pipe and I got a little sick. It happens. I just... I just wanted to avoid her judgy eyes, okay? I gestured back towards the door. 
I mean, this is Jesus country after all, and I feel like she would try to walk me through a pamphlet or something if I didn't say something. Karen appeared to buy it, and we continued towards the car. But trust me, I'm not looking to get saved anytime soon. I laughed. Yeah, who needs Jesus when you have me as your guardian angel? Karen said with an exaggerated smile and wink. I faked a gag. Ugh, you're gonna make me sick again, I said. She kissed me on the cheek and hopped into the passenger seat of the car. Brian had put on a Dandy Warhols album and was jamming by himself. He was singing poorly, so Karen took control of the phone and switched the song. A bohemian like you blasted through the speakers. All right, let's bounce, said Karen, putting her sunglasses on and lighting a cigarette. I tried not to look back as we drove away from the gas station. Give me a little bit to get the next section to you guys. I'll be getting all of this out to you as soon as possible. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family and on social media too. Thanks again for listening guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favourite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out, because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have, and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. The Showers Part 4 by Clover 10176 we spent another hour and a half aimlessly driving around the outskirts of Broken Bow. I was giving directions to nowhere in particular, lost in thought about the girl from the gas station. It was entirely possible that the whole thing was my imagination just getting away from me. My mind was filling in gaps in my memory with the worst possible reality. But deep down, I knew it was the truth. I saw the little oasis on the horizon before Karen and Brian did. My stomach went into freefall and my vision became a tunnel. I must have steered us there without even knowing it. I mean, that had to be it. Maybe you had to get lost to find the place or something. Maybe it sought me out. It didn't really matter anymore. I kept quiet, feeling lightheaded. If I said nothing, we could just drive right by it and let it fade from our lives forever. But Brian turned the wheel toward the trees without a word of guidance from me. This was the first point where I realized how desperately I didn't want to return to that place. I was sweating through the layers of clothing and trying to keep my composure, but I wasn't succeeding. Hey, uh, maybe we can call it a night and try again some other time, I managed to say. The words kind of fell out of my mouth slurred and robotic sounding. It was the best that I could do, though. Uh, I'm going to try that ominous looking patch of trees over there, but then I'm down for whatever you guys want to do, said Brian. I fixed in on the tree line as we slowly worked our way across the undisturbed field. I could feel the pull of the farmhouse and the tunnels, their weight dragging us toward them. The trees appeared to shimmer in the setting sun's light, the branches extended outward as if they were reaching for the car, beckoning us. Shit. Hey, Bob, that's pretty awful looking, Karen said. Ringing any bells? Uh, yeah, that's the place. 
the words went through my mind and out of my mouth in less than a second. I hardly even tried to stop them, in fact. Karen and Brian celebrated. I chewed at my fingernails. I had told myself countless times that I would never again set foot near Broken Bow. But here I was. I'd be lying if I said that I had never imagined it, though. Returning to the scene of my personal horror show to somehow get some answers or cast a light on what exactly the showers were. I spent a long time forming my own personal theories about the place, in fact. But eventually the effort just seemed pointless. The truth behind them didn't matter in the end, anyway. A part of them existed only within the confines of my story. What I posted on the internet and chose to show to the world. That they could be anything to anyone with just that account. From a meeting place for a violent ritualistic cult to a site for experiments performed by the KKK or deeply rooted Nazi post-World War II or something. I'm not dense though. I know that the real fear lies in the unknown. The horror was my bread and butter, remember. I believe that that's why the story connected with some people and left others disappointed. The showers in my story are filled mostly with whatever you bring to them. For me though, the showers were more complex. They existed outside of a, a rational thought and comprehension because my experience with them robbed me of these attributes, in part anyway. As we slowly rolled through the bush, tree branches reached out and scraped against the car's exterior forging new grooves and playing the metal like a warped record. The sharp grinding noises split my already aching head in two. I put in my earbuds to mute the noise. No music. I think Brian apologized about the car while Karen looked out at our surroundings like a kid who just stepped foot into an amusement park. That place meant something to me that I hadn't considered prior to that moment and still hadn't pieced together in its entirety. I just knew that as we began to near the clearing, I felt that I had never had a choice in making this trip. I was always going to end up back here, one way or another. Every time I told my story, well, Mr. Mazer's story, I dug the hole a little deeper. Every drink that I took to forget them, every girl I slept with to distract from them, and every fake fact I made up to distance myself from the real story just further solidified the fact that one day I would return. I was free to leave, go home and have all the booze and non-committal sex my body could handle. I could do these things because the showers are patient. They have time. All of my actions, though, were simply futile attempts at prolonging the inevitable. I know how it sounds, but I'm looking back on it now and telling you the simple truth. I was always going to return to the showers because they were waiting for me. Brian stopped the car just short of the clearing in front of an old tree that had fallen in the path before us. Uh, I could probably get over this, but I've already scratched the shit out of your car and this might do a number on the undercarriage, he said. Yeah, we can walk, Karen said, pulling on her coat. Uh, you guys can walk. I have some smoking to do, said Brian. What? We came all this way and you're not even going to look around with us? Karen wasn't happy, but Brian didn't seem to care though. It's the journey, not the destination, Karen, he said, mugging. Besides, somebody has to keep the car warm. Neither of them moved for a few silent seconds. Brian grabbed his Ziploc-wrapped grinder from the center console without any word. Karen had been more upset with him about less before, but he knew it would pass. Make good decisions, he laughed, turning up the music and turning on the headlights. Karen exited the car without another word, and I gathered myself and followed, shooting an annoyed but understanding look to Brian as I went. Karen was already up the path in front of me, I was staving off a panic attack, but I ran forward to keep up. So what do you think? I asked, trying to get her talking and not dwelling on Brian anymore. 
She looked up and around, pulling a small bottle of vodka from her jacket. We're not even on the ride yet, she grinned, half-heartedly. She took a long pull from the bottle. The setting sun caught the plastic just right and a ray of light momentarily blinded me. My head was still throbbing. She put the bottle down and I was able to see the clearing beyond her. And there it was. Or rather, wasn't. The massive farmhouse that had once occupied the clearing was nowhere to be found. There was nothing there but the same untouched dirt that made up the fields around us. Karen took notice as we stepped out of the trees. <sighs> Seems a bit empty, she said, disappointed. Are you sure this is the place? I was sure. My brain was still trying to tackle the absent structure. I, um, yeah, yeah, this is definitely it. I stuttered. In fact, this is pretty much exactly what happened to me last time. I walked the perimeter of the clearing, sipping from my flask. My eyes were drawn to the empty space where I was certain that a massive farmhouse had once stood. It shouldn't have been strange in hindsight. Old buildings got torn down all the time. But who had done it? And when? Did this mean that it wasn't abandoned when I had been here before? I couldn't wrap my mind around the situation. At the very least, there should have been some remnants of the farmhouse or evidence that the tunnels had been filled. There should have been a path in the trees carved out for the equipment they would have undoubtedly needed to clear the structure out. But everything looked totally undisturbed. In fact, it looked too clean. But this was the place. I was sure of it. I could feel it. The glow of the frosted ground was just a front. It was putting on a nice face to hide itself from me. I took another sip. There were no bugs, no rodents, no birds, no deer, and not so much as a spider across the tree line. It was winter, but surely there would have been something living in that place. There were no tracks or scat, just undisturbed land. It would have been picturesque if... It wasn't so oppressively ominous. I felt like I was losing my mind. So, where's the giant X? Asked Karen. Um, not here, I guess. I responded with a fake sigh of disappointment. I wanted to get out of there before it could reveal itself. I felt like the pressure in the clearing was building. Like I was standing in front of a giant jack-in-the-box or something. I don't know. It's... It's been over a decade, you know? Come on. There has to be something here. If the place was as big as you said, there has to be something left around, said Karen. Yeah, well, you would think. But I'm not too sure how big it was, actually. Thinking back on it, I said. It's kind of like when you go back to your old elementary school after years and... You can touch the ceiling, you know? I was working my way towards the car at this point, directly across the clearing. Karen circled me broadly, running around and kicking at the ground with her eyes peeled wide. The tunnels, though, she said. The cellar door. It's a big space. I shrugged my shoulders. I mean, trees could have overtaken it by now, or they could have been filled. They weren't the most stable things in the first place, in fact. Karen noticed where I was heading. Hey, what are you doing, Bob? She asked. Uh, I'm going to go and get warm, I told her. If it's gone, it's gone. It's probably for the best anyway, okay? Oh, come on. We've come all this way. We aren't leaving after ten minutes? She pleaded. It was a nice little road trip, but I'm tired and it's getting dark, babe. I put my hands on my coat and continued towards the car where Bryant sat. He was ripping a bong in the back seat. Well, that's some bullshit, she said from behind me. I turned around to face her. 
as she was powering through the vodka she had opened only minutes ago. With a flourish, she finished the bottle and whipped it over my head and into the trees. I didn't hear it hit. The growing pain in my gut flared. It was surely just something to do with the stress, but you can't breathe your way through an ulcer. I fell down to a knee. The ice on that ground had thinned beneath me. It was just frost and hardened earth, and my chest tightened. Listen, I think we should just go. I think I need to go and get some urgent care anyway, I told her. Yeah, how fucking convenient that is, she said. You're not getting your way and so suddenly you pull the trump card? Okay, Jack, I'll take you to an urgent care in the middle of Kansas. <sighs> Nebraska. I said. She shot me a look like a bullet, her body language shifting dramatically. Oh, I'm sorry, she said sarcastically, moving towards me. It's just that your story changes so fucking often that I don't know what the truth is and what you're bullshitting. She picked up a rock and whipped it into the trees. It wasn't thrown at me, but it was close enough that I considered it. I didn't hear it land. And then my jaw popped. Let's go to urgent care, Jack. They can give you some Ativan and tell you it's a panic attack again. But then we're coming back here, okay? She was flipping at this point. When you're in a relationship with someone with rapid mood fluctuations, you learn the signs and how to respond calmly to help make the whole situation easier for everyone involved. I, I knew her inside out. Man... Being a fucking dick, dude, I said. You also learn which buttons to push. The pain was getting to me. She stepped towards me with purpose. What in the fuck did you just... There was a dull and hollow thump beneath her boot. She froze and I froze. We both looked down to find a large set of wooden cellar doors that had been hidden by the dirt, debris and ice. But at that moment, it seemed impossible that we had missed them. A malicious grin crawled across Karen's face as she looked up at me. G'day, mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favor to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's B-I-S-H dot B-U-S-T-A at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the rest of the story. Let's just go, Karen, I said. She cleared off the doors with her feet. Please, let's just go. Well, what's down? She said, trailing off. We gotta go, please. Well, what's down there? No, what is down there? She repeated again, her gaze jumping between me and the door. What's down there? Her voice was getting louder. Make something up, Hemingway! She was yelling. What do you call a writer that doesn't write, Jack? My gut felt like it was bursting. I was frustrated and kind of drunk and stuck in a fog, and thinking about the girl at the gas station and how Brian was being rude and Karen was trying to hurt me. She was just baiting me at that point. But I bit hard. Oh, fuck you! You made me do this. I never wanted to come back here and you made me come back. And now you're going to chastise me because it doesn't live up to your expectations? I felt unexpected tears fall down my cheek. It's just a fucking story, Karen. A horror story. Horror as in afraid and story as in you weren't fucking there so you don't fucking know. You don't know what happened. I could have made the whole thing up. And I did. For you and every other girl that I told it to. I felt angry. A bubble of fear was growing inside of me. I wouldn't... You made me come here and I would never make you go back to... 
I stopped myself. I felt guilty. I had drawn a line and crossed it in with only half of a slurred sentence. Karen's shoulders dropped and her gaze shifted to the dirt at her feet. She then walked forward, filling the gap between us in an instant. And in one swift motion, she punched me in the face. I felt very little. Tell me what the fuck you're afraid of, you lying little piece of shit! She breathed through gritted teeth, staring a hole through my chest. I said nothing. It was my only course of action anyway. Big bad hero in your stories, facing down anything that comes in your way? I'm standing right here, so tell me, what are you so afraid of that you'd blow us up to avoid it? At this point, I had nothing. I... I don't know. I uttered under my breath. I could feel myself begin to wobble anyway. It wasn't the booze. It felt like my body was confused, like my brain was playing catch-up and I had left everything else on standby. It was the truth. I had no idea what was waiting for us in that tunnel. I couldn't muster a name or even a vague description because I couldn't remember. I had spent so much time embellishing and lying about it to reach certain ends that I had never really processed what had happened to me there. I never thought about how it changed my perception of myself, let alone my perception of reality. I never had to think about it. I just turned it into a story. And then I spread the story. I was doing the same thing that Mr. Maze had done, just on a larger scale lie. I distanced myself enough from the reality of the situation because it was easier to swallow. And most importantly, it was under control that way. But here I was now, being forced to face it again. And I had no control. It's a dark dirt fucking pit in the middle of fucking Nebraska, Jack. She taunted taking a single step down into the darkness, swaying the whole time. I'm going in without you. Fuck it. Please, don't. I begged, almost screaming. I was lost in the depths of a panic attack at that point, but I couldn't figure out the exact reason why it was happening. It was like I knew the reality of what waited in the darkness, but wasn't able to articulate it clearly. Karen took a couple of steps downward. Darkness swallowed her up to her hips. Don't wait up. She smiled, mocking me and disappeared into the cellar. She let the heavy door fall above her and it landed with a mute thud and puffed off dust. The clearing around me fell silent and I could hear bits of the frost-covered ground crackling quietly around me as my body heat escaped. I stood up and looked at my car's headlights, glowing bright in the distance. Brian was likely passed out in the back at this point, wrapped in his sleeping bag. I couldn't bring him in with me anyway. I don't think that I was allowed. I stared at the cellar door. I could hear no sound coming from below. There was no pressing need to go down there at all. If I waited quietly right there... I had no doubt that Karen would emerge, no worse for wear. She would give me shit about being a coward, but we would all sleep it off in the car and then drive off towards our regular life once more. Maybe... Maybe this was close enough. I had come back to the showers once again, despite my fears, and maybe now I could finally just let it go. I mean, Karen had seen the birthplace of the story she was obsessed over, and... I had confronted whatever it was that I needed to confront there. Nothing more needed to be done. After all, the farmhouse was gone, the land had frozen over, and it seemed like the place had been completely abandoned. It would never take anyone again. It would never hurt anyone again. All I had to do was stay right there on the ground and wait. Within seconds, though, I was staring into the beckoning darkness of the cellar. 
that the moonlight hardly seemed to pierce the black veil as I made one hesitant step downward followed by another. The door was heavier than I remembered, but what did I know? My memory was terrible anyway. I inched my way down the icy ramp and I watched my feet disappear beneath me, swallowed by the darkness. It took my legs next, but I was helping it along. Even through thick pants and boots, the darkness felt a great deal colder than it should have. In fact, my legs felt like they'd been submerged in icy water. I was in up to my knees when I felt a familiar shooting pain in my right leg, one that I hadn't felt in years. I knew that it was psychosomatic because, I mean, it had to be, but it ran up my leg so quickly that I grabbed at it on reflex alone. I had shifted all my weight onto my left leg, which had tried to root itself in a patch of thin ice. Of course, it did. I tumbled downwards into the abyss, the heavy cellar door falling behind me with a crash. All traces of light from the outside had been snuffed out with that door. The fall seemed to last longer than it should have, but maybe I was just panicked and unable to properly gauge the passage of time. I landed hard on my shoulder, which took most of the impact, and my head was second place. My shoulder hit, my neck whipped, and my head bounced hard on the ground. I think I lost consciousness again, but it was difficult to tell. My waking environment was already silent and pitch black and freezing cold, so there was really little difference between conscious and unconscious at that point. I don't know how long I laid there, but... I know I wanted to stay put as I felt the pain shooting across my skull. I rolled onto my back, groaning loudly but unable to hear it well. It sure as hell sounded like I was underwater. I reached my bare hand into my pocket to grab my phone. In hindsight, I don't know what I was going to do trying to walk down there without a light. I, uh, I hadn't been thinking clearly, obviously. I removed the phone from my pocket and pressed the home button to find a web of broken glass covering a picture of Karen and I on my phone's wallpaper. It was a selfie that she had taken of the two of us that could have been any of our numerous local breweries we frequented. Her eyes were closed and she was smirking while kissing me on the cheek. I was half smiling, my hair a greasy mess. My eyes were tinted red and I wasn't subtle. I didn't remember that. The screen flashed a message about a corrupt SD card followed by one about a low battery. I had done a total number on it in the fall. I swiped my thumb across the screen to turn on the flashlight. I could feel tiny pieces of fractured glass grind against my thumb. Just, just get me through this and I'll buy you a nice new screen. I whispered to my inanimate companion. I mean... I had to fill the silence with something. Still, my own voice sounded distant and muted. I opened my jaw wide to try and alleviate the pain in my head. It cracked four times in a rapid succession like bubble wrap, but the pain persisted. The light from my phone flickered to life, illuminating my surroundings. It wasn't as bright as I would have expected. Either my phone light was dying or those tunnels were eating the light keeping it from showing me more than it wanted me to see. But I could see enough. The little details came rushing back to me instantaneously. Gaps in my memory were filling so quickly that it made me dizzy. Were they really gaps though? No, nah, they had to just have been pushed to the side, overlooked, covered up. My leg began to throb like it had when I fell through the floor of the now demolished farmhouse so many years ago. I wondered if that hole was still there in fact, holding onto the piece of denim that it stole from my jeans. I heard feet shuffling behind me, in front of me and all around me. Every step I took was slow and careful and deliberate but still there was a brief delay and another step directly following my own. I told myself that it was just the echo, that the place had an echo, but it shouldn't have. And the familiar putrid stench burned my nostrils, 
It burned my eyes and made my now surely decaying stomach clench in an attempt to force me to vomit. Much to my dismay, I just gagged violently. It lit up parts of my memory that I can't properly verbalize, like the smell of a home-cooked meal or your childhood home. But instead of feeling comfort, I felt anger. I hadn't thought about that awful stench in years, but I couldn't grasp how I could have just easily forgotten it. It had always been there. How would I let it get away from me? And then I saw her. The child in the stained robe with the black hair. She was... She was twitching in the distance just on the border of my peripheral vision. Her skin was pale and her hair ran like vines down to her knees. Her gown was just as tattered as the last time we had met. She was gone with a blink though and I turned away. I had seen her since. She had been in my nightmares waiting for me and it was coming back to me. I would just wake up and move on with my day afterwards. How could I though? I turned back and she was directly in front of me. I could feel her breath warm against my face. Or could I? Her breath smelled like death. But did it? Her hair hung over my face, and only her eye was visible as it reflected the light of my... Wait. There was no light. No girl. I mean, there couldn't be. It was pitch black. I felt for a wall and my hand brushed against cold sheet metal, the kind that might be used as a roofing on a barn. It was rusted and really brittle. I grounded myself, but the smell remained. All of my lives, half-truths and made-up details about that place were finally stripped away. There was no more hiding from it and no more deflecting the truth. I was back in the place that I had sworn to never revisit, but was always heading back towards. Honestly, I had to laugh. I probably sounded like I was losing it. Years of sleeping on couches and subletting rooms, and I had never gotten comfortable with any of them. But somehow in this godforsaken place, I had somehow at the very least some familiarity. It was like a fucked up home, because as much distance as I had put between us... It had stuck with me. It was... It was part of me. And... That seemed about right. I was walking through a haunted house of... My own making. In my delirium, I began to wonder if that place had really been around before me. Or had I called it into existence. Was Mr. Mays just a kook who had inadvertently put me on a path towards manifesting this place of filth and evil? Was this a prison that I had constructed for myself? A tomb that I was always meant to die in? I reeled myself back in. It was like the dark and silent void was calling out for me to fill it, so my mind was attempting to do just that by letting anything and everything fly forth. But there was just too much space to fill. It would be way too easy to get lost there. I mean... That's how people lose their minds, isn't it? I told myself that I was going to go back on medication when I got out of there. I would need some Xanax at the very least. My light went out and I heard the familiar cry of an animal in the distance. It was coming from right in front of me. But wait. No. It was... It was a voice. It was the animal again. A dying doe. It was wailing so loud. It was in pain. I was in pain. The wailing was coming from within my head. The light flickered back to life for a moment and I took in the nothing that stood before me. I needed the light. When I lost it, I immediately began to lose myself. I was likely to spread out across that place in an instant and the light was the only thing that kept me there, confined but safe. I was in the realm of the known, and anything outside of that was where the real horror waited. 
A flash of bright red appeared in my peripheral vision. Of course, how could I have forgotten that? I turned to face the red door. It wouldn't have looked out of place on a model home in a white suburbia. Yet, here it was, out of its element, just like me. But the door faded and my light died once again. It was for good this time, too. I calmly told myself over and over again that when deprived of sight or sound, the brain will hallucinate, populating the glaring gaps with whatever it can. That none of this was real. I was in a hole in the ground in the middle of Nebraska and I was not going to lose myself there. I was wandering blindly through the darkness when I heard Mr. May's voice. It was not the joyful and calming one from his classroom, but the dejected and drunken voice from the bar. That's a bad place, Jack. I could smell the liquor on his breath like he was sitting in front of me once again. Cops, drunk, taken by wildlife. I could hear him slurring his words. I punched the wall in front of me. I heard only a muffled thud while the brittle and rusted metal sliding that covered the interior of the tunnel fractured. It shaved the skin right off of my knuckles. I felt nothing but the warm blood running down my fingers. This place was... It was taunting me. I'm pretty sure I screamed out, but I couldn't tell. I just... Needed a drink to rein my thoughts back into control, I thought. And my memories were populating this seemingly infinite empty space around me, and the only thing I wanted was for them to quieten down so that I could hear myself think again. I fell to my knees, and this is what it wanted, wasn't it? This place. Even though it couldn't want. No. I did this to myself. I wrote this ending for myself when I went chasing the infamous showers and posted about it on the internet. I built this extension of myself that was now eating me. It truly was just a hole in the ground in fucking Nebraska that I used to dump my own fears into. Nothing more. I wasn't going to end up like Mr. Mays. Karen was right. The room began to quiet and I could feel it shrinking. Fucking hell on earth if you ask me. It was him again. But this time, I was more acutely aware of the sadness, uncertainty, and fear in his voice. I closed my eyes, not that it mattered much. I told myself the truth. And Mr. Mays was just a, a tired old man. I couldn't tell if I was speaking out loud or not. He had a horrific experience in his younger years, and because of it, he lost a friend. The situation was... As simple as that. Maybe they found his friend's body and maybe they didn't. But it didn't really matter. Mr. Mays just couldn't cope with it and the emotional trauma was so great that he drank himself stupid to shrink it down to a manageable size. Something small enough to hide away and check in on on a really bad night every now and again. But it was still the driving force behind everything he did. I didn't realize what I was actually doing at the time, but if you just replace his name with mine, it might make some sense. I felt something creak from above me and felt a drop of something on my shoulder, but my attention was quickly stolen by something else. Jack? The voice cut through the silence with a knife and I perked up. My heart was back to 100 beats per minute. My brain was on fire, so... It took me a second to process what the hell was happening. Karen is a person. Karen is my girlfriend. And Karen went into the tunnel. I went after Karen. And we're both in the tunnel now. And Karen just spoke. Uh, Karen? Come closer to me. Come over. You were talking to yourself, she said. Her voice was soft and she sounded concerned. You were talking to yourself like you were sleeping just now. Why wouldn't you bring me here? This was the venue in which I finally had a real conversation with my girlfriend. A subground living nightmare in the pitch black as a disembodied voice. I don't know, I replied. She was audibly upset. I mean, 
After everything that I've given up for you? You're still going to feed me that bullshit? I mean it. I don't know. I told her. I don't know what this place is or what happened to me here. I can't explain any of this. Can you? There was a beat. I was pleading with her, but didn't know what my goal was. I was just letting everything out. I don't know what this place is or what it did to me, except that I wasn't the same after it. I'm just fucked up and I don't know why. I can't do anything about it and would never want to put you through this, ever. I was afraid. I mean, look at this place. I gestured all around me, but neither of us saw it. I could have helped you, she said, quietly. I noticed the past tense, too. I could hear her, either moving towards me or resting against the wall near her. How? We could have shared it. I heard the tears in her voice, and I didn't know what to say. Well, we are now. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family and on social media too. Thanks again for listening guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. Now, CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favorite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. The Showers, Part 5, by Clover10176. The walls were groaning around us, the noise concentrated above me. What is that? asked Karen. It sounds like something's going to ex- Ice cold water rained down onto me from above, instantly soaking me from head to toe. I gasped hard, taking in a deep breath and some of the liquid along with it while my every muscle tensed up from the shock and the cold. I could taste a rust or maybe iron or something. Before I could think about it for too long, my body acted without me and coughed and sputtered to rid my lungs of the tainted water. I fell once again to my knees. I knew exactly what hung a couple of feet above my head, despite the complete lack of light, but I didn't care. I wanted nothing more than to be out of this place, but I didn't move from underneath the shower head. I looked up and let the freezing rain pour directly onto my face, and I let it swallow me. If some cold water was all this place held for me, then I really did have nothing much to fear. I heard a loud and deep rumble that seemed to emanate from within the walls around me, and Karen screamed. I heard water pour onto the ground from my left, then my right, then in front of me and then behind. Still, I sat there while my hands pruned, feeling my breath turn to ice as it left my lungs. And despite the extremity of the situation, I began to feel calm from within me and slowly spread my arms out of my sides. The showers rained down around me, a symphony of crystal clear noise from the creaking pipes to the dull splatter of each droplet of liquid as it hit the ground fell over me. Every sound was clear and full now. The sound itself was so full that it almost illuminated the room in fact, carving out every last nook. I took it all in and I accepted it. If this place wanted me, it could have me. 
I had made a pilgrimage to the place that birthed the subhuman thing that I had become over the last several years. If it wanted me back, I wasn't going to put up a fight. I could hear Karen screaming my name and telling me that we needed to get the fuck out of here, but the showers grew louder, drowning her out. But this was more important. My body began to numb and my skin began to sting with every drop of water that hit it. A sense of instability, strangling like vertigo, began to overtake me. I opened my eyes, still seeing only darkness, but feeling something else now. I was Mr. Mays, back in his classroom. My classroom. Recounting the story of this place to my students. I was in the tunnels carrying my friend Steve, the man who first ventured to this place with me years ago, away from an approaching darkness behind us. He was bleeding from a head wound. I was reaching upwards in bed, sweating, soaking my sheets and crying. I was at a bar, telling me my, I mean, Mr. Mazer's story, struggling to find the right words while I ordered another... A dull wet thud rang out a few feet to my left, snapping me back to my body. Karen had fallen and screamed my name, which now rang out loudly above the noise of the showers. Jack, what's going on? She said as I heard what I could only assume to be her body drag across the muddy floor away from me. I could... I could feel again. I was freezing cold too. My injured hand could hardly move, in fact. I began to crawl forward as fast as I could manage towards the sound of her screams. They were going to find her body so that we could show them. No. no, I'm not thinking straight. There wasn't going to be a body. We were going to get out of this darkness. No one was going to be lost here. I threw my body in the vague direction of her screams, reaching out as far as I could with my arm despite being unable to feel much of it now. She immediately grabbed for me and I just closed my hand as tightly as I could around part of her denim jacket. I pulled her close and wrapped my legs tightly around her. She wrapped her arms around me and buried her head into my chest. Her screams were only slightly muffled at this point. I let her have that. I didn't know what else to do. I just held her as tightly as I could and looked out into the darkness... I don't know what I was looking for. Her screams eventually turned into loud sobbing as the water pressure from the shower heads audibly died down, eventually stopping completely. We lay there together in the freezing mud for quite a few minutes. Eventually, Karen's sobs quieted. We, we, need, to, we need to stand up, okay? I stuttered, frozen. I loosened the vice grip that I had on her and stumbled to my feet. I didn't let myself lose eye contact with her for a moment. She rose to meet me and we were as close together as possible. I certainly had no idea where we were at in relation to anything down there and I'm not sure that she did either. We just, we just gotta find a wall, okay? I locked my arms with hers and moved to my right, which was as good a place to start as many. After about ten long shuffles, I bumped into a solid cement wall. I couldn't tell if it was just covered in ice or if I was just so numb that I couldn't feel the core cement anymore. It was likely a bit of both. Karen kept her head against my shoulder and I started to feel emotional, angry that she had forced me to come back to this place. But the anger led into sadness she was going to have to carry this with her from now on. I should have never let this happen. I should have stopped her or told her that I made it all up. I was muttering to myself under my breath, the rusty pipes creaking around us. With each noise, I felt my stomach heave. Despite the numbness, my jaw throbbed in pain. I wanted to give up at this point. I was so tired and just so afraid. I wasn't strong enough and I knew it. 
I wasn't the person who was going to save his girlfriend and come out of this a hero or anything. I didn't even think that we were going to get out at all. I was lost in thought and putting most of my weight against the wall as I moved us along it. I was not expecting a sharp corner, but I felt my shoulder push into suddenly empty space. I managed to get one hand onto the corner of the wall as I fell, but that did nothing when my feet gave way in the mud beneath me. I fell hard, my head bouncing off the ground with a thud. I was instantly sure that I had broken some fingers on my right hand. That the angles seemed completely wrong when I rubbed them against my cheek. I screamed, mostly out of frustration, which caused Karen, now alone somewhere in the darkness above me, to scream back. We were yelling at each other. After a time, we were too exhausted and out of breath to continue. I focused on my breathing and tried to bring myself back. I sat up, pushing my left hand through the icy mud to ease myself to my feet. I felt something on the ground. It was smooth, but not like cement. Like metal. It was small, and I gripped it in my hand as best as I could as I stood up. My legs weren't going to hold out for long, and I was getting the spins, but... I couldn't tell if it was from the booze or the possible concussion or the disorientating darkness, but Karen was quickly at my side somehow. She grabbed my hands and pulled herself close to me. I'm so sorry. We shouldn't have come here. I didn't believe you. She said in quick successive breaths. I didn't care. I didn't want an apology. I wanted to scream at her and spoon her at the same time. I wanted to be fighting with her about something stupid in my apartment. The space around us filled with a mess of conflicting emotions. I felt a shrink, but was brought suddenly back when Karen broke the silence. What do you... what do you have in your hand? She asked. I had managed to hold on to the object. We both felt around it, desperately trying to get a sense for what it was. It could have been a piece of one of the shower heads for all we knew, but for a second there was hope that it was our solution. It was sort of cylindrical. It was mostly metal. It had a clip on it. I rolled it around in my hands, careful not to let it go. It had a button. I recognized it. It was a little flashlight. The kind hikers fastened to their backpack. It's a, it's a flashlight. I stuttered. And my fingertips could feel the button, but couldn't quite press it hard enough. You, you've got to help me, okay? Push the switch. The light was hardly blinding. Both Karen and I prepared to shield our eyes, but were surprised by the weakness of the light that, outside of the main beam, did little to help our situation. Once our eyes had adjusted slightly... We could see the shower head surrounding us in a run-down and filthy room that seemed to have no exit. It looked and smelled like a pigsty. Mud and dirt covered the floor and walls. She wrapped her arms around me and I held her against my chest. Close your eyes, okay? Just, just keep them closed. I told her. The loud wailing of a doe started on my left and quickly enveloped us like... It was coming from surround sound speakers that we couldn't see. Karen covered her ears and her frozen hands. The tips of her fingers were bright red now, or maybe even purple. It was hard to tell from the weak light of the flashlight, but I kept the beam centered on us as much as I could. I didn't care that whatever was out there could see us. The light gave us some sort of warmth, or at the very least a sense of solidity. The noise began to die down until we were left once again in silence. We have to move back to the tunnel, okay? You have to help me find it, I said. Karen nodded, tearing her face away from my chest. Her tears had actually frozen her cheek to my sweater. I could see a rim of ice around the red mark on her cheek. It's back that way, I think, she said, pointing to our left. The light didn't do much to penetrate the darkness, but I trusted her. We began to shuffle through the mud, which was now the consistency of a slushy. 
It had seeped into my boots, but it didn't really matter. Every inch of me was covered in rusty water and frost anyway. A little more cold wouldn't hurt me. Every few steps the flashlight would dim or flicker. I could feel Karen tense up every time I was forced to give it a shake, rolling the dice on how long it would continue to help us. At one point, it went out completely in fact. She dug her fingers into my side and I shook it. Nothing happened. I hit it with the palm of my hand several times and nothing happened. Please, please, I muttered under my breath as I hit the switch off and on several times in rapid succession. I couldn't let it go. It was all that we had down in those tunnels. The only thing keeping us, or maybe just me from losing myself to the darkness. After a few more attempts, there was light. But the light was across the room. An exposed bulb, maybe 40 feet across from us, came to life. It was dim, but... It was enough to light up a significant portion of the space in front of us. About 10 feet in front of the bulb and 30 feet from us stood the unmistakable silhouette of a buck, head bent down towards the ground. It had a large set of antlers, 12 points if I had to guess. Unable to grasp what I was seeing, I let the dead flashlight fall from my hands to the ground. The metal slapped against the cement and the small bit of the glass cracked like a stick snapping under a boot in the forest. The buck tensed up and quickly rose to attention. His antlers scraped hard against the low ceiling. Some of the points were grinding against it while others cracked and broke off. The animal didn't even seem to notice. Well, at the very least, didn't seem to care. As it turned its attention towards our general direction... Karen began to tug hard on my sweater. We, we, uh, we have to get out. C keep moving, okay? She said quietly. We continued down the path before us while the stag began weakly bleating. A jolt of pain shot through my temples. The noise went on continuously. One long whine that should have been interrupted by a breath at some point, but just kept going. There was... An echo. G'day mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favour to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's B-I-S-H dot B-U-S-T-A at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the rest of the story. I looked behind us as we shuffled through the dark, and I could see the glint of light reflecting off the eye of the beast. It was looking at me. It was tracking me. I turned my head and heard several other bulbs come to life on the far side of the room. But I dared not look back. A door came into view in front of us. The paint was stripped. The wood was aged and cracked from years of weathering. Even still, I was able to get a sense of the brilliant red that used to cover the door. The knocker was missing a screw and it hung limply off center. The knob still had some shine to it. I could see the reflection of the lights behind us in it as we moved closer. I went to reach my hand out to grasp the knob, but Karen had already beaten me to it. She grabbed it and twisted. The internal metal mechanism shifted loudly, quieting the bleating of the buck in the distance. The door cracked and creaked evenly as Karen peeled her hand from the ice-cold metal. The wood began to split. The cracks moved rapidly outwards from the knob, crawling across the wood until they reached the hinges. The door shifted and began to tip downwards. It was going to fall on us and I didn't have enough strength to stop it. It began to tilt and I raised my hand up and shielded Karen's head while trying to move us out from the way. Fortunately, the door caught on the old screws in the middle and lower hinges. 
it swung around to the left, right in front of us, and I felt the rush of cold air as it brushed within an inch of my face and slammed awkwardly into the wall. It fell to the ground with a resounding crash. Through the doorway, I could make out familiar winding tunnels. The ceiling rose and sank like a roller coaster. This seemed to be part of some twisted design. In some places, you could find no more than three feet of clearance from top to bottom. But right now, there was none. The metal sheeting that had held the earth at bay, it had given way at this point. This couldn't have been how we had gotten in, and it certainly wasn't how we were getting out. Fuck, I said, exhausted. My lungs were burning, and my mind was still on fire. Every motion that I made was out of instinct because I couldn't properly process what the hell was happening around me. Neither of us turned around. But we stood in front of the doorway staring at the caved-in tunnel that had seemingly sealed our fate. And Karen tried to cry but had nothing left in her and I couldn't blame her. I grabbed her hand and held onto it tightly as more lights flickered to life behind us. Surely if... We turned around, we would be able to at least see another exit, but the uncertainty of what else we might see stopped us. I heard the hard clapping of a set of hooves on the ground somewhere behind us. Then another, and another. I saw the shadows of what were unmistakably humans growing smaller as they moved towards us. It was the children. I was sure of it. Even amidst the already overwhelming stench, I could smell them. The pennies and vinegar. Their robes dragged across the mud and their hair covered them, having grown down past their knees now. But Karen gripped my hand back, and two shadows moved along the walls. Then five, ten, and after that I lost count. More bulbs came to life, and the frost that had built up on the cement walls began to melt. Each new light source caused the shadows to fade more. There seemed to be antlers atop the heads of some of the children before they were drowned out completely by more light. The room was warming now. One of them flickered just a couple of feet to my left. On my right, Karen's head turned upward. There, protruding several feet from the wall, was a shower head. It was old and rusty and caked with frost. It looked fragile, in fact. With her free hand, she reached upwards and grabbed a hold of the pipe and pulled downward, squeezing on my hand as if she was using me for leverage. It broke off with surprising ease. Karen pulled back into my shoulder as water sprayed into the room behind us. I could hear feet skittering through the mud and away from the jet of ice. Karen turned to face me, her eyes mostly closed, and she buried her face in my chest. She offered me the shower head, the weapon... I took the rusted metal pipe in my hand and for the first time in ages, I felt like I actually had a little bit of control, a choice to make. But the footsteps around us grew closer, of picking up speed. I swung the pipe through the air to my left and it smashed through the bowl with ease. Shattered glass rained into the mud as, to my surprise, the other lights in the room began to extinguish. But one by one, the room just fell back into darkness. I didn't know if it was better to die in the light or in the dark, but at least I got to break something this way. I heard the familiar bleating once again, alongside the dying cry of the doe. The footsteps were pretty close now, only feet away. I hugged Karen as tightly as I could when the last bulb went out. And there we stood in the darkness once more, surrounded only by screams of creatures that we couldn't see. I finally turned my head to face the room, still holding onto Karen. The bulbs had died, but the filaments still had a light glow to them. It looked like the glow that follows a camera flash, and as my eyes adjusted, I could still make out the silhouettes of the children. Some of them were no more than an arm's length away. There was a familiar anger in the air around them. They hated me as much as I feared them, and maybe it was for the same reason. I couldn't even guess what was going to happen once they got a hold of us, but I hoped that I would, at the very least, not be afraid anymore. 
The filaments in the bulbs cooled completely and the darkness settled. I closed my eyes. I'm sorry. I spoke into the top of Karen's head. The children were right on us now and I could feel a warm breath on the back of my neck. I snapped my eyes shut and without warning it ceased. The moisture on my back began to cool. Feet flew through the mud away from us. They were fleeing. The bleating and crying of the animals stopped abruptly and in seconds the room had settled into a deathly silence. I slowly opened one eye and looked upwards. About ten feet in front of us was a ray of bright light. It was powerful, cutting through the dark and shining straight onto Karen and I. It made the frost on her bright red hair twinkle and I had no idea what I was looking at and briefly considered that I was wrong about religion before I heard the familiar growl of a, a car engine. My eyes adjusted and I could see that the light was coming from a hole in the ceiling where wooden boards had collapsed long ago. I couldn't fucking believe it. I didn't say a word as a car door slammed and Brian's voice echoed down into the hole. Uh, hello? His voice rang out, filling the room. Karen looked up and broke away from me. There was a sense of relief in her eyes that her face didn't show. She moved quickly. Brian, you get us out of this fucking hole right now and I'll buy you your own grow house. <laughs> Promise? He laughed. I assumed that they could see each other now. Karen was looking up at the hole with a glare. She was bathed in light and I stood there and slowly began to move towards her. My knee popped and my joints ached. I was dizzy and confused, but this felt real. Tangible. Okay, but it's not going to be easy, yelled Brian. This rope is kind of icy, but I don't really have another option, and I'm still a little bit high, so it's going to have to work. How the hell did you guys get down there anyway? Karen didn't answer as Brian dropped down on old purple climber's rope. She grabbed it and began to ascend like her life depended on it. Brian was grunting from above and jokingly commenting on how she had gained weight. She was up and out of the hole within seconds and I was left alone in the room. I looked around me. The space was smaller than it had seemed just minutes ago. The walls were cracked. The mud had mostly frozen solid and the showers were empty. You coming, Jack? Asked Brian as I finally made it under the hole. I grabbed the rope tightly and looked behind me towards the decrepit red door that now lay on the ground. In the tunnel behind it, I could make out the shape of a, a person just standing beyond the reach of the light. I turned my back to them. With some help from Brian, I pulled myself out of the hole and onto the frozen ground outside. I breathed the fresh air into my lungs. I was finally free of the stench of that place, but my stomach was still in knots. The moon was reflecting off the snow and the ice, lighting up the clearing around us. I could see Karen pacing near the car. She was staying in front of the headlights. She stopped and fixed her vision on the edge of the trees. It began to sink in that she was now going to have to live with the same terror that I had lived with for the rest of her life. It was always going to be my fault too. I was on the verge of tears when Brian helped me to my feet. I still hadn't decompressed and my jaw was clenched shut and I was sure that I had chipped a tooth. Every part of me was numb now and my clothes were frozen to my skin. Karen began to cry. She yelled, it's right here, and pointed towards the trees as Brian dropped me and ran to her. I slumped down and just stared at the ground. There was nothing to be done, and if there was, I didn't know what it was. I was as much of a mess as she was. Her cry started to blend into the background as my mind wandered back to Mr. Mays. I wondered what he would have done in this situation, but remembered that 
he had been in this same kind of scenario, and his solution had been to drink himself stupid. That didn't seem like just a bad idea for the time being. I just... I needed a sip. I reached into my jacket pocket, pulled out the flask and opened it and took a sniff. But to my surprise, it burned my nostrils like a gasoline. It made me nauseous, in fact. I closed it and looked behind me at the hole in the ground. And I tossed the flask down into the dark. I didn't hear it hit the bottom. I stood up and walked towards Karen, whose cries were now more sporadic. She was jumping at her own shadow as a confused and stoned Brian tried to help her. Man, what's going on? He asked. Just, just make sure the car's ready to go, okay? I told him as I passed by without eye contact. Karen saw me coming and she froze. I took her hands and held them in my own. Jack, how is it like that? How were they like that? What was any of that? She rambled, unsure of what she had seen and what she wanted to ask. Eventually, she just broke down. She bawled and I just held her there. It was all I could do. She hit me out of frustration a few times, but still, I just let her go. I didn't know how to help her at this point, but I could listen and I could be a punching bag. I eased her over to the car and sat her in the back seat, wrapping her in as many blankets as I could and buckling her in. As I walked around to the other side of the car, I looked back at the hole in the ground one last time. I heard voices, but they were probably just in my head. Brian drove through the trees as quickly as he could. Several times he seemed to begin a question, but stopped himself. He told us how he'd been in the car when he saw a light coming out of the ground and what he thought was one of us waving him over. We didn't react. There was a weight hanging over Karen and I that he didn't want to disturb. The questions could wait. I don't even know if he ever got around to them, in fact. Karen wasn't asleep, but her eyes were closed tightly. I was... Uh, I was buzzing as we drove away. It wasn't until we crossed the threshold of the tree line that I was able to loosen the vice grip that I held onto the door handle. The electricity faded as the top of the trees that surrounded the showers were overtaken by the stars. I felt my insides began to relax. The dam that had been holding something inside me back finally burst and I asked Brian to pull over. He obliged almost immediately without a word. I stumbled out of the car and began throwing up on the side of the road. The only thing that poured out of me was a thick, yellowish bile that hung in the back of my throat before slowly dripping down and out of my body. This was what I deserved. I gagged and felt my eyes bulge as I purged and clawed at my stomach, sore from the continuous heaving. I clenched my fist and hit the ground, causing the wounds on my knuckles to open. I had only taken a quick look at my hand. My middle and ring fingers were broken. It looked like someone had taken a bottle opener to my nail and first knuckle. I shouldn't have left them that way, but I didn't get much of a reprieve before I had to bow again. This was the tail end of an exorcism. What felt like years worth of stress, lies and fear violently erupted from within me until my lips numbed, my stomach slowly relaxed and my ears loudly popped, immediately relieving some of the pressure on the inside of my skull. I felt like I was floating. I was crying and I knew why, but I couldn't quite isolate the thought. Everything was foreign. Everything in my brain was misfiring. I was rebooting. I'd made it out. I sat in the dirt long enough that the vomit turned to slush on the ground in front of me. Brian stayed in the car and looked in the other direction. I think I even felt Karen's hand on my back at one point, but when I was finished, she was in the car staring anywhere else but at me. I collapsed into the vehicle, shaking and soaking wet. Brian started to drive off before I had even shut the door. I saw Karen's lip tremble several times, but she didn't say a word. 
Honestly, I don't know how she managed that. I felt like I needed to talk about everything. I caught her looking at me only once on the drive back as we passed by the exit for Broken Bow. We forgave each other for everything that happened, though neither of us actually ever said it out loud. We didn't talk about the showers much at all. We had filled that place with what we had brought there, pain and truth about ourselves that we were using each other to hide from. The horror that we had experienced in that place was a dose of, as she had put it so many times before, perspective. It woke us up. I think we both realized, painfully sobering up over the six hour car ride back home, the two of us looking straight out of the windshield without seeing, that we were better off apart. Similar to the way that she had moved into my place, we never really discussed her moving out. Her things just started disappearing. We repeated the old mantra about staying friends for the next week or so, but you could practically hear it echo every time. And with a soft kiss on my cheek on a Thursday afternoon, she was gone. Karen and I couldn't work because we fit too well together. We were two uniquely fucked up individuals with a penchant for flipping on a dime. It's easy to look back and long for those nights of cuddling and watching movies together on the couch. It's a, a lot harder to remember reality. The night that we watched that movie and she convinced me to return to the showers, for example, was not as serene as I implied. I remember that I had gotten extremely irritated that she had picked that movie because we had watched it the month before and felt a, a deep resentment towards her that almost pushed me to apathy. And all that because of a, a movie. Before that, Karen had called me a, a stupid fuckhead because I hadn't cleaned the cat's litter box. And that was every night. A perfect couple and a perpetual potential domestic dispute rolled into one. Our solution was just to rinse it all down and repeat. We were our own perfect enablers and we were always heading towards the ending that we got. A broken bow did nothing but illuminate what was already in front of us. I really do hope that she's doing better now. As for me, I couldn't continue to live how... I was living after Nebraska. I was so covered in dirt and blood that I was able to have one of those hard look at yourself in the mirror moments in front of an actual mirror and realized exactly how far I'd let myself spiral down. I wasn't drunk or high but I was both those things because I was broken and needed something to fill the cracks and I couldn't use that place as an excuse anymore. I couldn't keep trying to change the story. If that sounds like it came from the mouth of a quack therapist, it's because it did. I started going to therapy once every week, initially for the drinking, but eventually for everything else. I'm not a religious convert or a friend of Bill, but I respect the journey and anyone willing to take it on, no matter the method needed to make it through. I sure do wish that Mr. Mays had found a way to fight his demons before he left. But I guess they're our demons, really. And I'll keep them for the both of us. I'm, uh, I'm always going to carry the showers with me. They're a part of who I am, but I don't have to let them kill me anymore. But the most important concept that I've learned in these therapy sessions is that you can't get better if you just keep covering up symptoms while ignoring the real source of your unhappiness. Now blowing your brain out every night with substances just puts off the inevitable confrontation. You have to treat it like a wart. You have to cut it all the way down to the root and tear it out to get rid of it. To kill it, you have to get every last piece. And that's why I came back here, to this account and this story. There are so many others out there who listened to Mr. Mays' campfire story throughout the years and then moved on like normal people. I fixated and spread it because I just couldn't resist. I can't unwrite my original story, 
so my next play is to obfuscate. I fully understand that writing this defeats that purpose. Hopefully that won't matter. There is a point to this. The story is yours now. I don't want it anymore. Take the showers and mold them to your needs. Tell the story around a campfire and embellish whatever you'd like. Put yourself in the story or a friend or a friend of a friend and then use it to get laid. Take your wildest theories about the place and create a story all of your own. Make a movie or a book out of it if you want. Turn it into a local urban legend in your own town. Just drown my story out with uncertainty, please. In fact, go there. Go find them. Ask every citizen in Broken Bow, Nebraska about them until they just run you out of town. You get lost on dirt roads a few miles east of the city until you stumble upon a place resembling the one that I've described and then tear it apart. You bring your friends and take pictures. Explore the tunnels, light a bonfire, get drunk and throw a party, and then post about it on the internet. Cover the walls in graffiti and the floors with cigarette butts, broken bottles and condom wrappers. Tell everyone you know about it and smother it. Flood the internet with so much speculation and rampant bullshit about that place that no one will ever point back to Mr. Mays or me as the source. Drown us in the noise and let us just fade away in peace. Go there yourself and burn it all. Just don't forget to tell everyone you know about how you did it afterwards. Ah, shit. I'm sorry if I let that go on for so long. That wasn't my intention. Old habits and whatnot. I've been pulling from a dusty flask of whiskey that was next to the laptop in a box. I, I guess it counts as aged now. I'm not really on any wagon and after the years of bullshit that I put my body through, a few more nips aren't going to hurt a thing. This is just one more for the road. After this, I'm going to post this, log out of my account tear up the sticky note that I saved with my password written on it, shut down this laptop for what I hope to be the last time, and bury it back under all the junk in my closet alongside this flask. Tomorrow, I'm going to go into my classroom at the community college where I teach a creative writing course and I'm going to tell my students one of the many versions of the showers that I've told over the years. It isn't Halloween, but Maybe I'll dim the lights and light a candle or two for atmosphere. And Mr. Mays would be proud of that. But the story that I tell them is not going to be my story anymore. No. I'll tell them the story of what happened to my best friend's brother's ex-girlfriend in some rural part of Pennsylvania a few years back. I'll swear it's the truth too. I can't take back what I did when I posted this story for the whole world to see. And... This is my next best move. I take a page from my younger self and spread this story like I'm playing a massive game of telephone that I intentionally want to disrupt and distort. If I wasn't at the heart of it, this could have even been fun. Hell, maybe it still will be. I gave you a story on some dark night five years ago, and the only thing I'm asking in return is for you to take it from me. Make it into something scarier or more violent, more cerebral or more personal. Give it a twist ending. My hope is that one day someone will tell me a version of my story, having claimed it as theirs with new facts and faces, and I won't even recognize it until I hear the name that now haunts others' dreams instead of my own. The Showers. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family, and on social media too. Thanks again for listening guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one.